Thing on the Sabbath, never forget it. Sabbath day, never forget it. Forget it, forget it. Want to take that away? That's right. Turn away. Forget it. Talks about the Sabbath. Get the Sabbath. Get the Sabbath. We all kept it. Never let go of the Most High. Never let go of the Most High. Never let go of the Most High. Don't ever let him go. to define my Isaiah 55 8 and 9 for my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are your ways my ways says the Lord for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts there's something invisible in the feeding with my journey. How did I end up way across the world in this country? One day a spirit took over me to just get up and leave. I left the place where I was born, me and my family. Mm -hmm. I'm just a pilgrim in the earth. My bags ain't packed up. And I don't know where I'm going mm -hmm. I'm going places Spreading truth I never thought I'd be And I don't lean on my own understanding Don't ask me where I'm going Cause I don't know It's a higher than All is my stance That's right mm -hmm. His thoughts are not even my thoughts. I go with his flow. Bless thy people, Mocha. All is my stairs. He keeps ordering my stairs. And you'll fall. I don't know. This, this way seems kind of strange. And I ain't gonna question it. It used to be frustrating until I found out he had a plan for my life. Some doors would be shut. I couldn't even enter. No matter how hard I tried. But when the path is open. He lays everything before me So I sit still and wait on him Gotta be still Cause he's guiding my journey He's guiding my journey I'm just a pilgrim down the hill My bags stay packed up And I don't know where I'm going I don't know where I'm going I'm going places Spreading truth I never thought I'd be Proverbs 
20 and 24. way to do it. Yeah. You know, I just picture myself sitting before the throne and singing this right here. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes, you're my guider in this life. 
praise you, your high. The most high is certainly good. He is our hedge of protection. He is our all-consuming fire. He wants all of the praise, all of the adoration, all of the worship belongs to you, most high. We bless your holy name, Father. I certainly pray, dear family, that today's Sabbath service worship in this study, the Bible study, finds you in the Most High's perfect peace. And I can say with inside of myself, just seeing the things that the Most High has allowed my eyes to see, and we're living in the very time 
a time that has uh, been heightened to where if you really get to a place in the moment that you first believed and that the, the things that the Most High has shown you as you're going on to perfection, the Most High begins to show you more. And certainly you do see grievous things that are unfolding in the world. You're hearing the reports of wars. Uh, we're hearing the reports of famine. We're hearing the reports of, of the sword, which is war. And you're hearing the reports of, you know, people's, uh, if you will, their faith or trust in humanity is totally slipping. People are losing their grips. You have uh, certain things that have been put into place through legislation that most people are not even aware of. You can kind of think of life on this plane as a mice in a maze. And the mice is just going through the, you're just going through the motions. You're going through the motions. You're going through the different, uh, uh, you're going through the different avenues and, and going down the road. And there's one who ultimately oversees all and knows all and knows the end because he declared the end from the beginning. But in the world that we live in, in this time, you and I must do what? Like it tells us in Luke 19 and 13 that we must occupy until Messiah comes. So I named today's Sabbath service worship and Bible study Israel's Deliverance. And we're going to look at some uh, text of scriptures showing how the Most High delivered our ancestors um, from Egypt, from the hard bondage. They were ready to go for. They had a readiness of mind. And we're going to see some of the plight. And we can, hopefully, you can liken that to those who are in the know, who are in the spirit, who are walking, um, you know, following the paths where righteousness is. And you yourself are also endeavoring to meet the king of glory. So you have to get yourself to a place to where you hold fast to your faith, the same faith that every single person who would ever enter into the kingdom, they all also had to abide in Hamashiach and keep those same principles, that same standard, that same belief until the very end and know that, that this world would try to make it hard. So you've, you've heard, uh, yeah, like if we did a news segment, just piggybacking off of uh, Monday evening's prayer meeting, dear family, I went into some things to show us how that, um, you know, most people in Western Eurocentric Christianity, they have a, a view of what the text of the Bible is. And it's, it's kind of been, if you will, uh, I guess I would say that their belief is somewhat warped and we would, I would pray and hope that they would really, really, if it be the most high will, to really further investigate, to, to, to really read the context of these scriptures and not just allow someone to tell you, to tell you about it, but read it for yourself. Search for the history of you know, the things, the, the prophecies that have happened. And I want to turn our attention to, as we get ready to go in, dear family, let me share my screen. I want to say greetings to everyone in attendance, those who have made it here to today's Sabbath service. Uh, I pray that you're all doing well and um, that you are prospering. And this is your time, dear family. During, you have an opportunity during the days of our joy to really send up a petition on your behalf, on behalf of those who the Most High has entrusted into you, to ask the Most High to really plead your cause and to maintain your cause and not allow you to be deprived of the life sustenance that you need, which is his presence upon your life. Because all around us, dear family, in the city that I live in, I, I can tell you that just in passing on um, the, on my on my news feed on the YouTube, it's, it's like two or three people that were that were killed in this particular region where I am, and I hear the same thing in other regions. You hear thousands of people being laid off from their jobs. Yes, you hear all these particular things that are happening from the uh, the fallout of the. Uh, and I want to be be mindful how I phrase it. But we 
what they would say the pandemic, the, the the thing that have happened a few years back. Many people are now. Um, some people, are, you know, life has been uncomfortable for them, and um, there's some who have lost loved ones. And so the thing is that, dear family, we have to keep our mind upon the Most High with all this is happening. You heard it over in Russia. They said that um, you know you're hearing the you're hearing the uh, I don't know if you want to call it proxy wars, or you're just hearing the, you're hearing things being heightened and agitated, and it almost seems like manipulated, and you're looking at what we call theater. But on the cuffs of last, or Monday's prayer meeting, I went in to show you that how there was a particular people, dear family, who were deprived, and who were pillaged, and who were used as stock, and that these particular people had, they had a, as the scripture says in uh, the book of Exodus 19 and 6, they were called to be what? A royal nation, or a, a, a nation of priests, okay? A nation of priests and a, or a, a kingdom of priests and a, and a holy or royal nation that's supposed to be that. So, and in the, in the time of them coming to uh, to the understanding of these prophecies and looking at the scripture and waking up and seeing all that's happening around them, that there was also someone that was planning their demise, okay? There was someone who was actually banking on uh, and, 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 and betting against them and trying to hold them and keep them in bondage. So we liken the plight of, quote unquote, the descendants of uh, you know, the the transatlantic slave trade, and uh, even that of the the uh, of the Assyrians who were were cast out of the land of Israel, right, in in 721 B.C. Um, but we liken all this to the plight which what is going on in modern time, and so I was showing things to show you that how in uh, they said the the Russia icons, they opened up from the 1500s to 1100s. They opened up their, their vault to show you that the pictures, the images of the people in this Bible had the melanated or the complexion of someone like myself or they were people of color, right? They were, they were, they were the, 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 the actual original descendants and, and the people that we read about in the Bible are people uh, of, you know, what, what they would call black or African American. So some people find it as a shock, but while all this is happening, when you look at the similarities from what the Egyptians did, and the Egyptians, by the way, too, were a melanated people. So it's not about black or white. They, the original Egyptians were black. Okay, or we were, and I'm speaking in layman terms, right? So, and they afflicted the Most Highest people. They said, "Look, let us come deal wisely. Let's let us deal wisely with these these Hebrews." They tried to do what? They wanted to what they would call. Uh, how do I say this? They wanted to control the birth rate, or, <laughs> if you will, unbirth, and not allow certain people who only the Most High gives the opportunity and it's his power to give life and to take away. But man has been, uh, has done done lawlessly, they've they done wickedly. And no one wants to admit what they did. No one wants to admit what they did in the sight of the Most High. They continue to go on the way until he seizes them. And just like he hardened the Pharaoh's heart, you see the same thing happening, so I'm going to be showing some things like that, like that today, okay? And connecting some, and putting some pieces of the puzzle together again here on this particular uh, Sabbath service worship and Bible study. So now let me share my screen with you all. Take a look here. Uh, share my screen with you, and this is gonna. I pray, dear family. I've, I've got myself to a place to where. I can really, I thank the Most High, where I can really focus in. We have to stay focused. I have to stay focused, right? 
Let's go to Revelations 19. And this is us getting ready to pray in. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Notice that at the beginning of this, on the 14th day at evening, they were to take a lamb and they were to do what? The lamb was to be slaughtered between the evening or at evening on the 14th day. And the blood would be on the doorposts and the lintels. And when the Most High said that he would allow his wrath via through the death angel to come through and smite the firstborn of man and beast in the land of Egypt, everyone who did not listen succumbed and suffered the same fate. So it says here, but everyone who did take heed to it and was in their house, the Most High did not suffer the death angel to smite their firstborn, their beloved. So it says here in Revelation 19 and verses 6, And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thundering saying, Yada, or as it says here, Alleluia, meaning praise, okay? For the most high power, omnipotent, reigneth. Seven, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife have made herself ready, verse eight, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. So there's a day coming that those who really are in, and I wanna, I'm going I'm to tie some things together here for us today. Those who are really in Hamashiach, and this is starting with Israel first, we're going to get a biblical view of how the scripture actually uh, lays itself out for us or comes open. The Most High opens his word to us or opens our understanding so that we can behold and get the correct narrative of his story. So it says here, the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife have made herself ready. Israel is making herself ready. Verses eight, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. The most high says he's going to get Israel her glory. Clean and white for the fine linen is what? The righteousness of saints. Saints are are those who live a sanctified life, those who are set apart, those who have a covenant with the Most High through sacrifice. It's not lip service. It's not just partaking and being a part of this. They actually have joined themselves unto the God of Israel to, for him to be their God. And they enter into a covenant with him. And he protects them. He provides for them. He gives them hell. He corrects them. He nourishes them. He destroys their enemies. Yes. He leads them down the path of the straight and narrow. He, he, he leads them on good pastures. He provides for them pastors that would feed them with knowledge and understanding. Men or pastors who is, are after the Most High's own heart. Verse 9. And he saith unto me, the angel saying to John the Revelator, write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of the Most High. Verses 10. And I fell at his feet to worship, to adorn him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant. An angel is telling a servant of the Most High, that he is a fellow, his fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony, the evidence, the proof. Today, as I sat down, a scripture came to my mind. I'm going to show it to you. I thought it. I would. I, I in my. I'm like, don't even. Say it. The, I know that the Most High deposited into me, and it's that the Gentiles will come to the light of Israel. That says that in Isaiah. Uh. Six, uh, Isaiah 60 for one, right? Uh, verses one through three. And we're going to get that later. But in specific, the one that came to me was Isaiah 49 and verses six. And as I just said, I jotted it down really quick. And then later I went back to it 
as I was getting the other scriptures for the text that we're going to go into today, to today and was just in awe of the Most High. Thank you, saying thank you to the Father that he would put that in my mind. So we see here, dear family, and it told us in verses 10 that the angel told John the Revelator, see it, see it, uh, see thou do it not, don't adorn or worship him. He's a fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Yeshia, but told him, worship the Most High. And if we worship the Most High, Moses told the children of Israel. Yeshia told his disciples to worship the Most High, and you cannot add to it, you cannot take away from it. You can't go to the right, you can't go to the left. You have to do it as the Most High said. So when we look in that, in Exodus 20 is a good place that we put that we put that into context. It tells us also in the book of Deuteronomy 6 and verses 5 that we are to serve the Most High our God with all of our strength, all of our heart, and all of our soul. And then the second is likened unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. It tells us that in the book of Leviticus 19 and verses 18. It also says that in the, the book of uh, chapter Mark, or the book of chapter, the book of Mark, chapter twelve, verses thirty and thirty-one, the same thing. So we have to serve the Most High with all of our strength, all of our heart, and all of our soul. But what you will come to find out, dear family, that if you visit the book of Jeremiah, chapter sixteen, and that the Most High pronounced a judgment, said, "Listen, neither mourn for these people." He told the prophet Jeremiah, not even to take a wife to himself because the Most High was fed up with the stubbornness and the stoutness of the people, his own people, who continued to rebel against him and follow the ways of the heathen, okay? They began to do these things. They were putting marks on their bodies and they were cutting themselves to mourn. And the Most High said, no, this is not how you do it. The Most High even told his holy prophet, listen, don't even mourn for these people anymore. Because there's a portion of them that was given to the sword, but yet in that we still see the Most High's compassion because the Most High would bring back the restoration. And it was said in the book of uh, that same chapter, Jeremiah 16 and verses 14 and 15, where it was said that the Most High that liveth, that bringeth the children out of Egypt, it's going to be said, no, the Most High that brought the children of Israel up out of the north country. It just so happens to be that a, a predominantly portion of, of, of Israelites are here in Northern America. And not only that, but all the places where he had scattered them. So as it tells us in verses 11, now look at this. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon, sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness. He doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of Ahia. 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. That sharp sword, dear family, is the law of the Most High. This is how the whole world is going to be judged by the Most High's law. So how do I know this? Because it tells us in the book of 2 Ezra 13 that that sharp, that, that sharp, that how, how you've seen uh, that, uh, that, 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 that man that came up out of the sea, and, and, and he was up in the clouds. You saw the man come from the clouds. That man that he spoke the word of the Most High, he neither lifted up a sword or nothing, but it was the law of the Most High that with it, it fell vehemently upon what? The inhabitants of the earth who, who the Most High's law was not in their inward parts. They didn't remember to keep the Most High God as what? As their love him with all of their heart, their soul, and their strength. As a matter of fact, they began to put up and make gods and make excuses for the things that they were doing, and they hated those who were doing actually what the Most High told them 
told them what to do. They hated and resented them. Okay, that, that's, that's the world that we live in right now. Watch, I'm going to show it to you. So, it says here that in verses, uh, verses, I was on 14, right? And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That means they were pure. 15, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the almighty power. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, who art in heaven, thou who sits high and looks low, Father, I ask that you would draw us in unto thee. Invite us into your courts, Most High. I thank you, Father, that you have given us another opportunity that, Most High, that we are taking this time during this feast, Most High, to, to rehearse the righteous acts, Most High, just like those who came before us, leaving a good example that we should follow, Most High. We lay it to heart. We tell it to our children. We instill it in them, Most High. And pray that, Heavenly Father, when they get old, that they would not depart from it, Most High. These are the ceremonies. These are the moads, the days that you have ordained, Most High, for a set purpose, Most High, that we might come before you with the spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving, that we might remember all that you have done, Most High, way back in Egypt and even in days of old when you saved our forefathers, Adam and Eve, when you had wrought the plan of salvation through the dearly beloved son of your love, Yeshia Hamashiach, who I love, Most High, who we love, Most High. I ask that you would give me skill, Heavenly Father. I pray that you would make this atmosphere conducive so that your love would flow freely. I pray that you would lend an ear, Most High, that you would be ever so mindful unto your servant, Most High. I ask that you would encamp thy holy angels around about, Heavenly Father, and so that, Most High, if there will be no tearing, there will be no undermining, there will be no disannulling, there will be no uprooting, plucking up, or pulling down, or none, Heavenly Father, that can stand in opposition to your sovereign word when you have declared and commanded deliverance for your sons and daughters who wait patiently upon you, Most High. For we are the workmanship of your hands, Most High. We ought to give you a praise clap offering. We ought to Sing psalms and praise unto you. We ought to be mindful that you are a righteous and a holy God and that you do not allow sin or iniquity. In fact, you hate it, Most High. You hate it so much that you sent your dearly beloved son of your love, Yeshia Hamashiach, who was made unto likeful, uh, unto likeful flesh, to sinful flesh, and yet he did not sin, but he condemned sin in his flesh. He subdued his flesh, Most High. And so, Most High, I arm myself with that same mindset that I am mindful, that I am encouraged, Most High, when I think about what Yeshia has done, Most High. When I think, Heavenly Father, upon your mighty acts and the miracles that you have done, Heavenly Father, and that you are doing. When I see that all that you are revealing, Most High, that you are laying it open for us, Most High, to those who want to be right, who want to get right with you, Heavenly Father, that this is the day that you have made. We will not, I will, for, for one, will not put it off another day, Most High. But, Heavenly Father, with all of my heart and all of my soul, I desire to bless you, Most High. You have truly poured into your servant and answered thy servant's prayer here in this time of festivity of this time of joy and happiness even when i did not have you have been my ever-present help you have been my my hedge of protection most high you have been my song and my dance most high you have been my exceeding great reward you have been my healer most high my counselor heavenly father you have been my all-loving heavenly father my teacher my guider most high you have chastened thy servant most high when i was out of line most high you have also, Most High, guided my path, Heavenly Father, so that you might ordain thy servant, Most High. For if I do not make myself of any reputation, it's not by my own merits, it's not by head knowledge, it's by the revelation, as we just read in Revelations 19 and 10, that even the angel, Most High, 
told John the Revelator, see that thou doest not. Don't worship me, but worship the Most High and, and, and worship him because unto him, he has given the, the victory. You have given the victory to the few over many Most High. And so, Father, whenever we come against whatever it is that we face in this life, we know that we have the full assurance, Most High, that we can look over over the, over the existence of the earth and see has there been has there ever been any that have waited upon you and been put to shame? Well, the answer is no. It may seem like it to those heavenly Father who don't have that experience and who haven't walked with you, Most High. But for those who continually walk with you, to to those who you manifest yourself to, Most High, I just want to bless you. I want to say thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have put a roof over my head, that you have woke me up this day, Most High, that you put a song inside of me that I might be able to lift up my voice unto the heavens and say, Praise be to a higher, for you are worthy, Most High. You have made us fearfully and wonderful, Most High. No matter what comes or what life brings my way, that Most High, I know that Heavenly Father, with you on my side, Most High, I'm able to, I'm able to truly successfully, Most High, get through the challenges of life and also see the importance and also cherish the the the, the lessons that I learned out of life, Most High. So we'll see that Most High, just like Job, like all of the holy prophets, they didn't just, you didn't just give things into their hands and they skated on into the kingdom. Abraham himself was thrown in the fire. You said, Most High, that you allowed your sons and daughters to go through the hardship to know, for, for they might know whether that we would obey you or not. And so, Father, I thank you for all of the struggles in life because in the storms, Most High, you were there holding us, Most High. You were there comforting us, Most High. Surely, Most High, I've seen things that have grieved my soul, Most High, when I see how people can kill people, Most High, and shed and spill blood. You told your sons and your daughters, do not go down the path of the unrighteous. It's full of thorns and it's hazardous. Your word declares most high in Sirach 17, uh, excuse me, Sirach 21, that the path of the sinner is paved with smooth stones. And then it also tells us in Sirach 7 that the end of the wicked most high is fire and worms most high. And so, Most High, save our souls. You have saved our souls from the pit. You have shown your word to Jacob, Most High, a sure word, Most High. So as we take this time, Heavenly Father, to gather in the sight of you, Almighty, I pray that you would look down from your high and lofty habitation, your holy habitation, and behold, Most High, the souls that you have created I pray that you would bless this assembly, Most High, even though we may be few here in number, Most High. It's not about the quantity, but it's about quality. So I, for one, Most High, will march into the battle, Most High, remembering my forefather Judah, Most High, how he would always rally when he would see the enemies and the opposing forces, Most High, trying to encamp around his brethren trying to uh, discourage his father, Yaakov, trying to steal their joy, trying to uh, uh, impose upon them and to try to make them afraid and to steal their courage and, and zap their faith, Most High. He charged into the battle. Judah means praise. So Most High, since we are the tribe of Judah, we will praise you, Heavenly Father. And the spirit of holiness and, uh, of, of, of the, and the beauty of holiness and spirit in truth, I magnify you this day, Most High. I thank you. I see what you have done. I see everything that you are doing for me, Most High. And so yet, Most High, it gives me strength. It renews my soul, Most High. And surely, I have fought multiple battles. Yes. My whole life has been, it seems like, a battle. But it is the sacrifice so that I might present myself to you, Father, as a sweet, savoring smell. So that most high when you come amongst us in this abode to this house that you have sought fit to make me a husband. You have sought fit to make me an able minister. You have sought fit to make me a father and a grandfather. You have sought fit most high to make me a watchman in Israel most high. You have sought fit 
most high, to make me an intercessor, prayer warrior, most high, that I might go on the offensive for the kingdom of light, most high. And that, Father, you have brought into my remembrance, most high. You gave thy servant a second chance, and you have cleansed me, most high, from my filth. You have cleansed me from my iniquity, most high. You have cleansed me from youthful lust, most high. You have cleansed and saved me from presumptuous sins, most high. For I don't want to be guilty of the great transgression, most high. But I ask that you would spare thy servant, most high. You have shown me visions, most high, that would totally frighten, can even kill. And most high, you have kept me alive, most high. Most high, you have breathed into me your reward, most high. And for that, I'm forever indebted, most high. I'm indebted unto you and grateful for your perfect laborers, most high. And watchmen, most high, that you have assigned to speak and to teach, most high. And to deposit and to prophesy unto me, most high, that I might lay it to heart, Heavenly Father. And so, Father, as I stand here before you, open and naked, Most High. Know that, Father, this day, this seventh day, Most High, of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, I am so grateful, Most High. Every, I'm so grateful that, Most High, when I travel, Most High, you know the things that we are currently in need of, Most High, and the things that have been taken, Most High. But, Father, you are able to replenish and give me much more than that, Most High. So I count all the things that I once used to count as gain, as dung in comparison to knowing Yeshia HaMashiach. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for being my shield and my buckler, Most High. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for exalting my, my horn like that of a horn of a unicorn. That means my voice, Most High. So I say, put your words in my mouth, Heavenly Father. I thank you that you give me health, Heavenly Father. Your word truly is health to our soul. You are the greatest comforter, Most High. There is none that can comfort like you. There is none that can stay or stop your hands, Most High. There is none, Heavenly Father, that can dethrone you, Most High. There is none, Heavenly Father, that can stand in opposition unto you. There is none, Heavenly Father, that can threaten you, Most High. There is none who would and be utterly smitten and pounded into dust, Heavenly Father, that tries to that tries to uh, uh, look at your word and your law with audacity and insolent, Most High, to deny, Heavenly Father, your commandments and to reject the law of life that you have given to us who will, will not be totally seized and persecuted and taken into custody by the, excuse me, by thy elect holy angels most high. For if there was, it would be a surprise if there was yet one sinner who was able to escape. For Father, you see everything, Father. And we fear thee most high. We bless you most high. Most high, be pleased to dwell and allow us to dwell with thee, heavenly Father. Be everything that we need and call upon you for. Ahia, that means to come to pass. That's who you told Mashiach to tell to the children of Israel when you delivered my our ancestors out of Egypt, Most High. And until you, Father, do we cleave unto you, like it says in Deuteronomy 4, and I believe it was verses 5 or 6, those who are, are cleaved to the Most High are yet alive this day. So, Most High, I know that you are making a way. And so I yield to your counsel. I yield not to any evil entity, any evil inclination, any evil desires, any corrupted communications, most high. I don't yield to those things. I go on the offensive for the kingdom of light, most high, to combat the wicked, most high. Father, I superimpose your sovereign word and will over my life, most high, and the lives of those that you have entrusted into my care, most high. I cancel the assignment of the devil and his cohorts, his underlings and his minions, most high, and his phony cronies, most high. Father, I ask that most high, that supernatural hedges of protection, most high, would be put in place, most high, around me and my family, most high, around those that tremble at your word, around those that rejoice to see the salvation of Israel, most high, to see your people march into Zion, most high, that we can praise you, most high, in the wilderness, most high, that we would inherit an everlasting kingdom that has no end. So, Father, let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so, Father, 
as we get ready to go into this study, Most High, we ask that, Father, that you would make us of quick understanding. For Most High, you are our shepherd. We shall not lack. Thou leadest us, and thou makest us lay. Thou makest us lie down in green pastures. Thou leadest us beside the still waters. Thou renewest our souls. Thou keepest us walking on the path of righteousness for thy name's sake. Yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we shall fear no evil, for thou art with us. Thy rod, that same rod that we read in Revelations 19, Get this, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort us. You gave Moses a staff, Most High. And Father, you told him to part the sea, Most High, with it, Most High. And he believed in you, Father. He gave the law and delivered it unto the people, Most High. And he wasn't a man of a great, elegant speech, but he was a man, Heavenly Father, that was humble that truly cared about the people most high. And it was your presence, your anointing that was upon him that truly made him a servant in your house. And so as your rod and your staff comfort us most high, we ask that heavenly father, that you allow no tarrying, that as your rod and your staff comfort us, thou preparest a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Although they are conspiring and they're holding back. Remember the 40 acres and the meal we talked about that on Monday evening's prayer meeting. How the government of the United States, uh, uh, what would you call that? That they reneged on that which they were supposed to give to our ancestors. Those who have actually slaved, were, were, were enslaved. And then also they were, uh, when they had to be let free at a time, that, or at least that's what they said. And what did they do? They went back and they reneged on their word. And then they looked at the people they, and they recruited us into their armies. All these things, Father, do you yet know? You know the things that they are planning and devising for us right now the same way that they did. When I say they, that the enemies of your people that they did in Egypt most high. Father, like our forefather Abraham prayed, Father, maintain, please, Father. Remember his prayer. We are his descendants most high when we obey you and we follow after the tenets of the faith coming unto you and the dearly beloved son of your love. That blood covenant most high that we read in Hebrews 9 that everyone must go, must come under heavenly father. And so father, as you prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemy, thou anointest our head with oil our cup runneth over surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we will dwell in the house of the most high now what would you be doing in the house of the most high did you know that his house is a house of prayer for all people of rejoicing and praising so come and go unto the most high not with a double mind don't be so swift to think that you know anything. Uh, just be still and allow the Most High's Holy Spirit to begin to penetrate and impenetrate your heart. Take away from us a stony heart and give us a heart of flesh. For anyone that comes to the Most High must first believe that he is a rewarder of those that earnestly, and that meaning diligently, seek him. So what has stopped you, dearly beloved? from diligently seeking the most high. Be relentless in your endeavor to seek the most high and do not cease until, do not cease with praying until the most high avenges and he pours out his wrath on the pate of the insolent and of the unmindful, of the prideful, of the arrogant, of the boastful, of the impious, and allow the Most High, allow His wrath to take place. Don't seek to get your own vengeance because the wrath of man 
worketh not the righteousness of the Most High. So Most High, give us skill. I pray for the lamenting women, Most High. I pray, Heavenly Father, that the elders, Most High, that, that the priests who minister before your altar, Most High, as it says in Joel 2 and 17, and say, Father, have mercy upon thy people, Heavenly Father, and give not thy inheritance over to reproach, and do not allow the lawless to stampede upon thy people. Do not allow unclean spirits to rule over and vex the souls of any of the righteous. But most high, we ask that most high, that you would avenge us speedily, most high, and that you would send forth your angels of wrath and destruction, most high, upon those who cause trouble for us, most high, upon those who wish our downfall, most high, upon those, Heavenly Father, who can't stand the sight of us worshiping you in the beauty of holiness, in the, in the spirit, in the beauty of holiness and of, of, of truth, most high. So, Father, as we yield unto you, I ask that you make the atmosphere conducive so that your love will flow freely, Most High, and that, Heavenly Father, that you would impute upon us your righteousness and forgive us of our sins, Most High. Wash us from our iniquity, Most High, so that we do not sin against you and create in each of us a clean heart and renew within us the right spirit. Give us a spirit of discipline, Give us a spirit of devotion. Give us a spirit of dedication, of temperance, so that we would be self-controlled and not given in to base things, Most High. That means the first thing that just comes to mind. But Father, you have called us to a higher standard, Most High. And the things that you esteem, Most High, is what we seek to chase hard after. For the things that man esteem is an abomination before you. So, Father, we rid ourselves of the pollution, of the filth, of the things that we may have learned when we were in the world, Heavenly Father. We don't want to bring any of that pollution or that corruption into your house, Heavenly Father, for you are a righteous and a holy God. And with you, actions are weighed in the balance. So I thank you, Father, for all of the prayer warriors and intercessors, all those who, per who perpetuate the name of Israel, Father. Thank you for your uh, uh, infinite wisdom. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your holy prophets and your holy apostles, for the holy angels, for your dearly beloved Son of your love, for your Holy Spirit that you lavish upon us, Most High. We thank you, Father, in advance for all that you do. And we decree and declare in the name of your Shia that we are of sound mind, content, and courageous, and that no weapon formed against us, whether in the spiritual or the natural, this world or the world to come, the seen or the invisible, foreign or domestic, they simply cannot and will not ever prosper, but they must and will cease and desist immediately at the name of Yeshua. Having seen it, I see it, I believe it, and I receive it. And all of the Father's children say, Amen. Glory to God. Praise Ahia. I'm going to praise him. I'm going to praise my power because he is so worthy. He strengthens his servants. And according to the book of Deuteronomy 8, and I want to say verses 18, that it is the most high that gives us strength to get wealth. Let's get ready to go in, dear family. We going in something serious. We are going in. I'm going to move at a moderate pace. A lot to cover. I hope you're able to, to, uh, to follow along. And I hope you're in a place to where you're able to focus and get this. Sure. Let's make this. No, that looks pretty big right there. I think make it a little bit bigger here. We're starting here now.
going to start here for us. One second, I need to grab something. Here we go. I think this might be a good one. I might have to show. First, I want to show this right here. Just a couple. Let me share the screen here. We'll keep this picture. Where is it at? Uh, stop sharing that. And now let's share. Let's share this here. So we see here on what they would call one of the teachings through replacement theology, the seven dispensations. So you have the time of, uh, and there's different ways that they break it down. You have innocence. Innocence is where the Most High made Adam and Eve, placed them in the garden. And then you had a time of consciousness when the serpent came in or the devil through the serpent came in and he revealed and uh, he manipulated the woman and made the woman promise that she was going to, that poison that she partook of, that she was going to give it to her head. If she, remember the Most High told him not to eat off a tree of knowledge of good and evil. So what happened there is the curse of death was pronounced. Okay. Then we talk about this flood came. The flood came, that was the time when what? So I'm giving you a, a biblical analogy of if you will, human existence. Not just humans, but also where angels and so forth, all you know, the creation of the world, if you will, how the Most High made it. So then in the time of the flood, once the consciousness came in, also in this particular time, you had fallen angels come down. Genesis chapter 6. The, the mankind thought wickedness all the time. So in their conscience, the cognitive part of their mind, the seat of, of understanding and learning, it was advanced. So something catapulted mankind from going from innocence to a conscience to just becoming so corrupt to look nothing like what the Most High intended the man to, or man and the woman. When I say man, speaking of mankind, right? To look nothing like what the Creator made them to be. They did what? They were splicing roots, mixing animals with people. They made hybrid beings. Some say, you know, you look for this is where dinosaurs and stuff came from. They did what? Uh, man with man, woman with woman. They were doing these particular things. They were practicing bestiology. They were practicing cannibalism. They were practicing enchantments and divinations, and they began to worship the fallen ones, the, Elo the Elohims, the, they begin to worship the gods. So the Most High seen all of this and said, man has corrupted himself. Let us go down. So the Most High said, listen, he flooded the world, so he warned Noah. Now at this particular time, remember that, that a righteous lineage was still in the earth. There were those who feared the Most High. They were seeing this and having to deal with all of this. Okay, the, the most Enoch was alive, right? His son, Methuselah, Methuselah had a son named uh, Lamech, okay? And Lamech had Noah, okay? And Noah would begin to, if you will, refresh 
those who grieved from seeing all the evil because the Most High was going to save. Noah was a man who was perfect in his generation. He was perfect in his, if you will, his anatomy of his body or his makeup or his cells, what some people call DNA. And also his reverence and fear of the Most High. He was one who, he was a preacher. He was called a preacher. He was someone that cried out, so the Most High chose Noah. Stick with me. So through Noah, eventually he had a son named Shem or Shem. Shem or Shem was Noah's eldest son. So everything that the patriarchs before Shem had, they instilled into Shem. Shem was also named Melchizedek, which was what he became king. He was a king and priest of the Most High God. He was the king of Salem. Salem is another name for Jerusalem or the city of peace or Shalawam or Salam. Okay, and, and, and what, they, what they call it in, in, I don't know, in Islam, they say uh, Salam, uh, Salam Aleikum or whatever, right? So Salam, Salam is another word for peace. So what we see there that the flood came, wiped them out, wiped the wicked, wiped who out? Wiped the wicked. The wicked was taken away. The righteous was left. I need us to get this. After that, Noah, along with all the creation, the Most High wiped out all the, the, the hybrid beings, all of that, flooded the whole world. The wrath of the Most High was angry more than anything that we could even could even fathom in our, our time here. Okay, we think that we go through, through things. And yes, everyone goes through things. Everyone has a time. Everyone has a moment. But imagine seeing a worldwide thing happen like that. But it's pointing more to that. But staying on point. So the flood came. The Most High told and instructed Noah to preach for 120 years. So that was that time of grace before the Most High's judgment came upon the world at that time. Everyone that didn't listen, it was only eight souls that listened. Noah, his wife, his three sons, and what? Their wives. So eight souls entered into that ark, as well as the, the clean animals by pairs of seven and the and what they would call un, what, what the scripture calls unclean beasts, they entered into the ark. Once they went in there, the Most High had the angel sealed them in there. The moment that they were in there, the rain descended upon the earth. Now it got the attention of everyone else that was doing the things that they was doing them. Remember, conscience, their seat of conscience, their mind, exponentially. It's like the days and age that we in. Like when I'm sitting here praying, when I'm thinking through the week. I'm seeing all the stuff that in the world and the things that I've learned, but it's like the most high guiding my path, my mind, so that my mind does not deviate from the path of righteousness to begin to start thinking about what everyone else is doing and what, what the things that what, what I want to do. OK, what does the most high tell us to do? So in other words, so we see that through the conscience that came that flood because man thought wickedly all the time. His mindset was evil all the time. The Most High told Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. So Noah took heed to it. Now we see that the flood came, the Most High wiped out the, 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 the wicked, the unrighteous, and then he wanted, to, then he began to replenish. He told Noah and his sons to replenish the earth, be fruitful and to multiply. He gave them through him. A family came on the scene. That family would be what you would call a theocratic government, a theocracy, meaning from the Most High himself down to his priests. And that was the government that was before because from Adam all the way down from, we know uh, righteous Abel was killed by Cain, okay? And so that, that they had wickedness going on. The wicked, they took a pledge. They made a covenant with death in hell. They did that. They said that they would get rich and fame by killing, by doing all the, by lying and thievery, and then they made an oath and a pledge to keep that amongst themselves and do that and not to break it. Okay, this is the same thing that's going on in the world today. So, when you see that that human where it says human government, that government was passed on to Abraham or Abraham down to his descendants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who the Most High named Israel. He also promised them that through Abraham, when you go into Genesis 12 and 3, that through you, all of the seed, all, all the earth, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through your seed. 
We know that Yeshua came through, through him. Not only that, but his descendants would be priests. Okay, so that promise came. Then we see that they went in, he promised them a land. Not just that, but the whole earth, that they would rule the whole earth. Then we see what? Egyptian bondage, slavery, mistreatment. Okay, so from there, they left through that Israel, left through that, you see where it says Israel, the promise, the law, was given the law, and then it says they were given the law, right? The law of life, the eternal, the law that has no ending. Remember that the feast of unleavened bread, which is the which is the Passover, there's no there's no end of days to this. They would they would they would be the children of Israel would be keeping this throughout their generations forever. But we're told that what look look what you see here now, sin came in because the law told man again it was to teach the people the difference between what. The holy and the profane, or the holy and the unholy. So now man had a conscience because his conscience, although a man was already made with the conscience, but in the polluted world, if you see everyone doing it, then your defenses to propel that, your standard gets lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. There was a time when to be, you know, people of the same sex to be, you know, together and, and doing things, that was was deemed to be something that was, you know, you, you do that, that people that did that, did that in their own house and their own privacy. And it was, you know, the public would look at that. That's something shameful and disgraceful and distasteful. It's, it's uh, anti-family, if you will. Right. But nowadays, you know, it's the thing that's, you know, it's being put out or when I say put out, being put up to, to, to flaunt that people as something that's honorable and you know what inclusion let's include everything no the most high has a way so now we are told that you see the israel and you see sin they were given the law and it says that because the law was spiritual and that the people were earthly or fleshly they weren't able to keep the law because they didn't keep it with faith so even when they were given the law they didn't know that the law was just a shadow of better things to come with better things the Lamb of Ahiah, when you look in Hebrews 12 and 2. Okay, it talks about the law was a shadow of better things to come. So now we're told in this particular day and age that we're in the church age, which is grace, and that what's going to happen, That so you see with the red line, the church and the grace age, the church is the Gentile people, and now Israel, because they fell off, the Most High is certain ways that they want to deal with replacement theology. Israel has denied the Most High, and they say that the Jewish people have to accept their God and they're going to build a third temple. All this, they're fabricating prophecy, right? Meanwhile, when you look at Jeremiah 23, it says Israel will be safe at home when Yeshua comes. So there's certain things that, that the Most High reminds biblical Israel, okay? He, he, the seed or the house of Israel, he, 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 he shows to them to guide them. We're being guided. I'm being guided, dear family. I know it beyond any shadow of a doubt. So, we're told here that the church is going to do what? You see that arrow pointing up? The church is out of here. They're being raptured up. Meanwhile, Christ's tribulation's coming, right? So when the church is being raptured up, that's supposed to be Christ coming. Now you see tribulation, okay? Christ, right? And then, and then, and then so after the tribulation, after the three and a half years of tribulation, so they put to the three and a half years, when they because times, times, and dividing of times. People say it's just three and a half years. Well, there's what you call uh there's like biblical years or prophetical years where a day could equate for a year, okay? And the most high counts time through Sabbaths and through Jubilees. Okay, through through the Jubilees. So as we begin to understand that, so we know a thousand years is twenty Jubilees. Right, because if you take a thousand and you know you 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 break you know you put fifty years into it, fifty times two would be a hundred. But if you you know you add another zero to it, then you have a thousand. So then you see what the great white throne, that great white throne, that judgment. So this hundred 
this that, not the hundred, but this millennial kingdom is when Yeshia himself will rule on the earth as heaven him when you look at Revelation 19. So I just wanted to put that in view for you. So this is important why as we're rehearsing these righteous acts to keep this all in mind. And let's look at another view of what they tell us here. Let's look at this one. Uh oh. Let's see if I can. <coughs> Creation of man. Right? From the top right there. Expulsion from Eden. Eden is paradise. That's the heavenly Jerusalem that the Most High took back up. Then we begin to see the beginning of civilization. Man began, the most, the man was kicked out of the garden. And ultimately, Cain began, he began to build cities. Okay? Then we see the, the seed of consciousness. And they begin to sin, right? The landing of the ark, the flood, government. You see the call of Abraham, that's that family, okay? See the confusions of tongues, the law given to Moses, Israel. So again, Israel, everything connects back to Israel, the biblical Israel. The law given to Moses to give to Israel, not only that, but the name of the Most High God revealed to the Israelites, Ahiah, okay? Then we see also uh, Israel dispersed in 586 B.C., right then it also talks about here this is where Yeshia where it talks about where you see that when they put the crucifix right there that's you know Yeshia on the scene him dying on or being hung on the tree okay cross just means capital punishment by the Romans so he he suffered an excruciating death but he he, he took it and buried all of our our iniquity and our sins on the tree okay so he died, went into the earth, went into the, the middle of the earth, which is, which is hell, if you will, Hades. And he took the righteous souls and brought them over into the, the bosom of Abraham. Some people say that they, that they just went up to heaven with him. No, that's not the case. That's through, you know, that, that's through, you know, Christian, Eurocentric Christianity teaching. There's none who have ascended to heaven yet, okay, except for the son of the most high and those who the most high put up there. Those who are in Hamashiach are resting. They're resting in the bosom of Abraham. And yes, the, 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 the face of the Father smile upon them. The Heavenly Father smiles upon them. Okay? They're in that boat where the righteous is. Okay? So that we see here, then we see uh, the ascension of Hamashiach. Then we see in Acts chapter 2, we see the Holy Spirit come down. That's the Feast of Pentecost. That Feast of Pentecost is right here. If we look, if I'm on my holy on, uh, on the Holy Armor Ministry website, if we go to the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of, of Weeks, we see here, this is what it is. Feast of Weeks, also called the Feast of Harvest or the Day of First Fruits, which fell on the 50th day after the Feast of the Passover. Okay. So these are things that, that we ought that we ought to know that you know looking at it, this kind of keeps us uh, mindful, it refreshes us from one season to the next season. These are the things that you got to keep on your mind because if you don't, you'll then begin to think about all the things, how to get money, how the things that you want to do, vacationing, uh, you know, a business, all these things that you might end up putting before, you know, decking yourself out treating yourself, not to say that, it's, that you can't have nice things, but if you put those things before the Most High and forsake keeping the Most High's Holy Sabbath, then as the saying goes, out of sight, out of mind. So this is prophecy. This is a sure word. So we see here that what, what, what does it say? They say the Holy Spirit descends. Now we're in the age of grace. Now we know that, yeah, we're given grace. So now under the law, the scripture says under two witnesses, those who were, who were worthy of death would be stoned right there immediately. So if according to the law, if, any, if, if the kingdom, if, if, if Israel or if Yeshua was on the scene, okay, and his government was on the earth, any whoremonger, any uh, disobedient child that, that one's as a lunatic, 
that, that, that brings shame upon their family, that curses their mother or father. I'm just giving you some examples. Any adulterer or adulteress, any of those people that was found doing that would be dealt with on the spot. They would be unalived. It would be, in other words, that they would be, it, the commandment would be to stone them. So now we know grace does exist because no one's executing a judgment to end someone's life. They, they have liberty, meaning grace, to learn from that mistake and not do those things, but tell them, show them the judgment. What happens to someone that does this, this type of behavior? What does the Almighty say? Okay, so but now through Christendom, we're told that now that's the grace, I no longer have to keep Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. People will celebrate Ishtar or Easter. They'll celebrate Christ's Mass, which is Mass meaning death, the death of Christ, right? They'll celebrate that. They'll celebrate the ceremonies of the Gentiles, right? But yet, the things of the, the Feast of the Covenant, they know they don't know about. See? So now that, now we're also told here that um, during this time of grace, you got confusion of religions, and then you have what? The rapture of the church. That's what they're told. We're told that. Anyone in the Western Hemisphere, if you're going to church and, you know, maybe raised as a Christian, you hear these particular things, and what do they get that at? They get that at... 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16. Let me go there really quick. Doing a lot of explaining. Are you with me so far? Is it making sense? Okay. How about you online? Is it making sense? Do you, you all knew these things right here? Is it bringing it into view for you? Follow me. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16. What does it say? For Hamashiach himself should descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of the Most High. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be what? Caught up together. This is where they say the rapture is. With them in the clouds to meet the Messiah our head, to meet the Lord Yeshua in the air, and so shall we ever be with Hamashiach. So wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So, those in Christendom, that's the whole of a faith or a religion called Christianity. This is one of the main, now I'm not saying every person that's a Christian, but uh, uh, holds to this, right? Some people believe that. I would say secular mainstream Christianity that taught this, right? So, what do we see? This is what they're told the rapture is. So, the church is raptured up, tribulation for everyone else. Now, I just caught wind of it. The people who went and bought houses here, and you know, they're, you know, getting the, they want, they're going after the American dream and getting land and you know, notice how they would say the feds who control the interest rates, right? The Federal Reserve. Well, there's been some news, dear family, to where people's, they're not, they did not lower interest rates. Okay? So the people, anyone that have put their hope and trust, and I'm not saying there's nothing, I'm not saying there's something wrong for trying to better yourself. You, you should do that. But take heed. Like, everyone should be preparing themselves, right? They should be preparing themselves, preparing themselves for the coming of Hamashai to make sure that they're living a holy life and living within your means. So tribulation is here. When you heard of, in, in this particular area, not when I say this area, I think somewhere out in, I think it was Iowa, like a thousand people, right? A thousand people in one small town or thousands of people just they went to work and their job ended like that. They're crying. They were out there crying, and I, you know, I feel empathy and, and sympathetic for the fact that people lost their livelihood. But man, we've been down. When I say we, Israel, those who understand, we've we've been feeling the the blood of the tribulation. So now the Most High is bringing the full circle. Everyone, no flesh can glory in the Most High's sight. See, so 
tribulation, people don't realize it. The devil wants people to realize it once it's too late. Okay, that, that, that tribulation has been happening. It's not just the three and a half years what they told us. Israel's been going through tribulation. Okay? So, what do we see here? They say, after the, after the tribulation, Christ returned. But when we look at 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16, they're saying that's this area right here, the rapture of the church. And notice that word church. Then they say, that they're off. They say this is the, the wedding lamb. They're going to meet Yeshua in, in the heaven, and they're off for seven years. Isn't that correct? Seven years of tribulation. They're off in heaven, and they're having the wedding, and they're with the Lord Yeshua. But that, that's not what the scripture says. This says that, they, that, that if you look at the text, it says that the trumpet will blow when the trump of God, and then the Lord Yeshua will appear. He'll come on the cloud, and all the, all the armies in heaven following him. And then the dead in Hamashiach, see, I thought the people who were dead was already with him, though. The dead in Hamashiach, that means those who are in Abraham's bosom will be called up from their place to meet Yeshua in the air spontaneously. And then we who are left will be called up to meet them in the air. And he's coming to where? He's coming to the earth. So in other words, when it says called up, that means we don't know how it's going to happen. It's going to be something supernatural, miraculous. We'll get a glorified body. Okay? That's what you call the first resurrection. So then we see what they say here through replacement theology or the seven dispensations, then the tribulation. Okay, tribulation, then Christ's return, Armageddon, Christ's kingdom. Okay? Okay? Then the, great, then the great throne of judgment, final rebellion crush at the great judgment, a new eternal heaven and earth. Now, now that I showed you that, let's get back on, back on point. What about the church age? Is that biblical? Is this concept of the church age taught within the Bible? It may surprise you that there is not a single text in the scripture which mentions a church age which will come to an end during the time of the second coming of Hamashiach. No church age. Whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Hamashiach which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles, other nations, should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Hamashiach by the gospel, where I, where, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of the Most High, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Now, we know that through replacement theology, also there's some I want to highlight and expound a little bit on this. When it says that there'll be fellow heirs, they're fellow heirs to, to, to life, okay? They, they're not necessarily um, ruling, okay? Because the scripture says when you look in, you have, to, you have to put precept upon precept, line upon line. When you go into Isaiah chapter 14, let's read this really quick. For the Most High will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people, meaning Israel, shall take them and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Most High for servants and handmaids. See? And they shall take them captives whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. So in other words, when, as the scripture says, and what? And Exodus 12 and 49. Reading quick. It says, one law shall be to him that is homeborn and unto the stranger that sojourn among you. So in other words, dear family, 
we are to treat the other nations who the Most High saved as in our neighbor that if, if they make it into the kingdom, okay, if they make it in to with the saints to be citizens of, because why? The citizens, we are the city. Israel is that city, that holy city. When you look at Isaiah 60 and verses 14, it says, let me show it to you really quick. I don't mean to be all over the place, but the, the scriptures is like, you know, I'm like an artiste painting with the scriptures, okay? Put the scriptures on our mind. So when you go into Isaiah 60, this is the only way to get the, the, the proper interpretation, okay? And not philosophizing. What does it say? The sons also of them that afflicted thee, afflicted, that was those who oppressed us, shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet, and they shall call what? Thee, you Zion, you Israel, the city of the Most High, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Crystal clear. Getting back on point. So now that we see that, dear family, where it talks about as the Gentiles, they're, that's right, the Most High through Hamashiach, the same way that we were saved, the Most High is saving the Gentiles from damnation and hell as well, okay? But they're not getting the same promises to where the, the promises that were given to Israel, because that's a promise that was given to Israel, all right? So it says, Unto me who am less the least of all the saints is this grace given. I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Hamashiach and to make all men see what the fellowship of the mystery. Of the mystery. Remember that fellowship? 1 John 1 verses 2 and 3. Really quick. A lot of scriptures that are coming to mind here. That really, The Most High really wants us to see this. 1 John 1 verses 2. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and shew unto you that eternal life. So even the Gentiles, the other nations are able to get this eternal. It's like me being an Israelite, like some, some Israelites telling people that, listen, if because, you, because of your skin tone or your ethnicity, you're not, you know, there's no salvation unto you. I would be then standing in the seat of the scornful. Okay. I, I would be standing, sitting in the seat of sinners then. We're not to join hand in hand with sinners, whether they're the sinners of our own, of our own ethnic group or the sinners of the Gentiles. So it says here, we have seen, we have seen it and bear witness and shew unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, this is Yeshia, and was manifested unto us. What does it say? That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. So this is the same thing that we read in Isaiah 14 that I just read. That, again, the strangers will cleave to the house of Israel. Right now, they might, they're not thinking of, of doing it. There's some. They're seeing it like when they heard that, wait a minute, when they're seeing the icons of Russia, and it's coming out now. Wait a minute, Russia's opened up, opened up his vote. Remember, think about this. They said there's like 50,000 pieces when there were millions of pieces that were destroyed depicting the biblical personage of the people in the Bible as melanated hue people, as, as black people, if you will, in layman's terms, okay? So again, it says here, that which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is what with the father and with his son Yeshia Hamashiach okay so now we made this like Paul was saying making this mystery made known to you but what happens is you have the theologians which are trained experts come in and they would give you their commentary Telling us this is mean this that this mean all the, the Gentiles is, get, is on on the same the same uh, uh, level uh, of getting the same promises of ruling with Yeshua. That doesn't make any sense. 
Every other nation had their chance of ruling in the particular earth, except for Israel. And then when Israel rules, Israel's not running around saying, look at us, we're we the head now. You bow down and, and kiss our feet. And <laughs> that, that, that would be ludicrous. Israel's not making, the, the Israel of the Most High, is not making peoples to serve with rigor. Rigor means ex extreme harshness. Okay? We're not making people's jobs or duties to be hard like the nation. We're not putting policies, contriving policies to, to embitter those who would be made subjects unto us in the kingdom. Now we're looking at them as if they're our fellow brother. It's, it's the most high who put everyone in place. And if and whoever don't like it, got to take that up with the most high. So and it says here, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world have been hid in the most high, who created all things by Yeshua Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the, it says church, but before 1524, there was no such word of church. The manifold wisdom of the Most High. That means it's multifaceted. So that which we are able to see, we can thank the Most High that you have some revelation. And I said last week, what you do know, thank the Most High for and be mindful of it. Unless, you know, you allow it to slip out of your mind. If you allow it to slip out of your mind, you become unmindful. And then, you know, the Most High stops your eyes from seeing. Okay. Then it says here, according to read that last sentence, heavenly places, so he made known to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of the Most High according to the eternal purpose which he proposed in Christ Yeshua, our Messiah. The, the Most High's eternal purpose, here it is. The Most High's eternal purpose, which he proposed in Christ Yeshua, is that the Jews and Gentiles be united into one family through Yeshua HaMashiach. Okay. In other words, I would say to be, yes, be, be in harmony. Paul refers to this unit, this union as a church. Now, we know that they're using church, but they, this means called out, in other words. They are to be called out, to be different, to be separate. There is no such thing in scripture as a Gentile church. There were congregations to which Paul's ministry served that consisted of mostly Gentiles because they were in areas heavily populated with Gentiles. But never is the church identified as a Gentile entity in the New Testament. The church is always those from among the Jews and Gentiles who are united into one family in Christ Yeshua. The concept of the church age. Are you seeing this? The concept of the church age. Right here, see? Let's see if they, let's see if they have another one. I know they have another. Let's see if they show a picture of where it says church age. I'm looking for one. Is this it? Right there. It's all blurry right there. This one's not a good picture right there. But yeah, they talk about they talk about that church. Is this one right here? One second. Wonder why it's so blurry right there. In other words, that church age, or what they call the church age, is right there where you see church. That's what they'll tell. That's a part of the deception. That would make Bible reading. And I say Bible reading because some people read the Bible blinded. Yeah. Make them totally ignore. They have compassion, but they're not putting things in this proper context. They can't see it. They don't understand prophecy. Okay? So the concept of church is, is predicated on the idea that the New Testament church is a Gentile entity. This is a faulty premises for the church is not a Gentile ent entity. The church began with the Israelite followers of Hamashiach, who took the gospel message first to the bruised, then to the whole world. 
according to the Apostle Paul. The Most High will be glorified in the assembly, or they say church, by Christ Yeshua throughout all ages. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding and abundantly, or exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Yeshua throughout all ages, world without end. Okay, that's the same thing that it says in Acts, and I can't even say Acts, the same thing that it says in Isaiah 45 and 17, Israel would be a world without end. So that's what that's, that's, what that's relating to right there. But Israel shall be saved in the Most High with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. Same thing. Now, if you're waiting for the church age to expire so God can get back to separating the Jews from the Gentiles, it's not going to happen. The Most High is going to be glorified in the assembly, they say church, this is the union, or let's say, of Jews and Gentiles in Hamashiach. That's those who have the fellowship. The same thing that we just read in 1 John chapter 1, verses, 1, uh, verses 2 through 3. Many prophecy, prophecy experts claim that the Most High has a separate plan for Israel than the church. Even though, and there's a word for it, it slips my mind what that, what that saying is. But there, there, is a, there is a word for that. Um, so, many prophecy experts or, or self-proclaimed experts or theologians claim that the Most High has a separate plan for Israel than for the church, even though the church, equal ecclesia, called out or set apart, is an Israelite concept and was established on the message of, of the Judite apostles who were sent by Yeshua to proclaim the gospel. It is Gentiles who were grafted into the Israelite message that Yeshua is the Messiah. He is the Savior sent by the Most High. Uh -oh. And not the other way around. Israelites are not grafted into a Gentile entity. When they believe the gospel, rather Gentiles are grafted into the family of Abraham. See, when you go back over to that picture that we had right here, when it talked about family, where's the one that said family? Right here. See, Abraham called, promises given to him. So, but they get that through the faith in Yeshia and having faith in Yeshia is just not reading the Bible and just saying, and, and saying things out of our mouth and doing what the Western world doing because the Western world is in apostasy, Okay. Now that any anyone that follows the tenets of Eurocentric or Catholicism, it's in an apost it's an apostate to the true faith of the disciples that they were keeping. Now, let's go here to let's read Isaiah forty nine. So I have it here in verses six. This is that scripture that I told you that came to my mind that the most high deposited into me. And he said, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore what the preserved of Israel. I also will give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Let's go ahead and precept that with Isaiah 60, verses 1. We'll read down 1 through 
1 through 5, and then we'll jump down to 10 through 14. Isaiah 60, verses 1. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Most High is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Most High shall arise upon thee. So I know I read that fast, but it told us, dear family, the darkness shall cover the earth. So this darkness also is obscurity and gross darkness to people. So in other words, people will not have that light, the tenets of the faith to guide them. Every man leaning to, remember that conscience? Remember, just the same way. The conscience in their mind, they're just doing, every man has a way that seems right to himself, but the end of those ways are death. But it says here, right, in gross darkness, the people, but the most high shall arise upon thee. And his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles, verses three, so the other nations are going to come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. And it just so happened, just so happened, dear family. Is this it? Just so happened, we were showing this here. Fair use. I, I, I think that you all should be able to hear this. Let's see. My favorite. Not that. Not that right there. Let's, one second. Fair use for journalists and, and educational purposes. $1,300 to $3,000. So it's not an easy book to get. I actually borrowed this book from a friend. You know, this book has a lot of... Um, interesting depictions in it. A lot of them pertaining to the, to the Bible. Like right here, this is the transfiguration of Christ. And you see it's, it's black people in caves, I believe, what it looks like. It's black people in the whole picture. But this is um, knowledge that escapes black people here in America. Um, it's definitely something that we would never see or never hear about in the educational system. Now, I'm pretty sure there's people that are um, black history um, college students mm. majoring in black history or world history, and they've never seen nothing like this before. At least not from the standpoint of Europe, you know. This is the crucifixion of Christ. And in it we see uh, angels, black angels. Uh, the people surrounding him are black. It's very interesting because the images that we see are contrary to what we have known our whole lives or what we have been taught our whole lives. And told. Like I, I said again, like these type of images of antiquity escape black people here in America. And I can say all people for in general, just people in general don't know. I'm pretty sure there's plenty of Caucasian people and people of all nationalities that don't know the extent that black people covered the earth. And in many cases, like here, like what you see, uh, we're in rulership position. This looks like a a king. The images of Jesus and other historical figures in Russia's black icons challenge the commonly known perception of antiquity and reveal the extent of black people's presence and influence throughout history. Paintings from the 1500s and 1600s depicting black icons, including Jesus and Mary, in a highly sought after book that explores the history of black people in Russia, Italy, and other parts of Europe. The book contains interesting depictions of black people in biblical scenes, which is knowledge that is not taught in the American educational system. 
However, debates concerning the authenticity of these icons goes on. And Alex Pismeni, a software developer and Catholic Christian, has some things to contribute. The Russian Christians adopted Byzantine Orthodoxy wholesale. That of course includes the iconography. The fundamental principle of Orthodox iconography is, no changes. The icons are as much as possible portraits of Christ, Our Lady and other saints. Further, the styling, mood, garments, gestures are all fixed in the Byzantine style, so much so that students of iconography refer to these rules as iconographical canon. Even though very little of that canon ever went through the normal ecclesial legislative process involving episcopacy and councils. Going forward, while Russia continues to amaze the world in this light, the unquenchable fire of truth persists through the darkness of history. Not so long, protesters had called for the removal of Confederate statues in the US. Activist Sean King went further. I'm going to stop that there. Get back over here. So we see that. You know, the rabbits, are, it's been out of, out of the hat. So the scripture tells us here, and going back to Isaiah 60, where we left off at verses verses 2, and it says, and, and the Most High, but the Most High shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Verse 4, lift up thy eyes round about and see. All they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy son shall come from afar, and thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. So this is a future prophecy of Israel. Like when you go into Jeremiah 16, the Most High says, uh, excuse me, Jeremiah 30, starting at verse 16, that the Most High says that all those that spoil you, he's going to spoil or that he would empower Israel to spoil. So it says, verses 5, Then shall thou see and flow together, and thy heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. That means that Israel is going to be, that the, that the people of the Most High, that they're going to be, again, uh, in position of, of authority the sea is going to be converted back to them and the forces of the gentiles shall come unto thee so they'll bring all of their riches their armies or whatever the case is at the at the, the prompt or the command of israel okay under under the leadership of hamashiach and the son of the stranger shall build up thy walls see this and their kings shall minister unto thee for in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. Verse 11. Therefore thy gates shall be opened continually. They shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. Verse 12. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. Verse 14. The sons of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet, and they shall call thee, what? The city of the Most High, the Zion of the Holy One. Notice what it said, all that afflicted them. So initially this is going to be a change of heart because most people aren't viewing things like that. Most people who are in their prosperity or in their rulership and having life the way that they want it or believe in the things that they've received is true, they're not going to take the, the biblical narrative of what the Most High outlines in this book of prophecy, right? That sure testimony. Okay, remember Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. They're not going to outright lay down their arms. They're not going to lay down and give you the, or give or give Israel what you call the forces of the Gentile, meaning they're going to bring in all of their their revenue and like Israel, like Jerusalem will be the capital, okay, the capital of the world at that time. Let's let's take a look at this here. I want to uh, I want to share this with you with you all. I I watched this uh, this video. I want to watch about three minutes of it. This report of it tells us right here that uh, Elon Musk gets gets upset when Don Lemon blames his success on 
it says white privilege. Let's let's look at this right here. Let's 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 view this here. Okay, for for uh, journalists, journalists and educational purposes only. No copyright infringement intended. Fair use. In 2024, realizing he needs a new gig because ultimately he got fired by CNN for being a partisan, well, not even a partisan act, just being a, a hacky old hack hack. I, I think we, we, we want to look to the future rather than the past. Um, and uh, instead of engaging in uh, constant rehashing of the past, uh, because it, it, in, in fact, if you look at history, if you study history broadly, everyone was a slave, everyone. Yes. Well, not everyone was a slave. No, everyone was a slave. Okay. But we, 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 are, we, are, we are all descended from slaves. Yeah. Well, all of us. Yeah. But, um, so it's just a question of when. Was it, was it more recent or less recent? That's it. Right. Um, so the, but what, what future do we want? Do we, is this something we want to make a part of our constant dialogue forever? Or do we, do we want to say, like, let's just move on and treat everyone, uh, you know, uh, according to just who they are as an individual. I agree with you with that. That's the ideal. But what the evidence shows is that that's not what's actually in practice. I think we're doing it better than anywhere else. That, that's true. I agree with that. But that doesn't mean anything, that doesn't mean a lot to a whole lot of people who aren't able to take advantage of the opportunities that you are able to take advantage of simply because of the color of your skin. Well, what advantages what advantage does it do? What color of my skin do you mean? Well, there's a certain, there's an ease that you have in society that you, that many people of color don't. You were able to come to this country voluntarily. There are many people who were not able to come to the country voluntarily. There are people who came here as slaves. And there is a legacy of slavery that still continues on. There's a legacy of racism that still continues on in this country. That's, and that's undeniable. Well, if, if, if we keep talking about it nonstop, it will never go away. If we keep making that the central thing, it will never go away. Well, why do you believe that? I think I'm just making a simple statement of fact. Um, so, I think, I think we want to get away from making everything a race or a gender or whatever issue. And just treat people like individuals. Do you have any desire to understand what many people of color and even trans people um, how they now notice how they just threw that in there subtly. So they get you going off of, and, and again, these two individuals that we see before, I'm sure they're, you know, both well off financially having the things in this particular world. And I want to remind you, I just want to state that's what he said, yes. Wow. So, why? Because his personal lifestyle. His person, so, so notice how when I look at the things that have befallen us, I look at it from the context of the Bible. On one hand, it's alleged, or at least that's what, in passing, I hear that they say Elon Musk says that he's a Christian, right? Um, the other gentleman, I'm not sure what he, what he professes, what his faith that he believes in. Nonetheless, the Most High says that all souls belong to him. And you look in Ezekiel 18 and 4, right? All souls belong to him. And the soul that sins, the Most High says, it shall die. And, and death is, is being cut off from the provision of the Most High. It's, it's actually not having fellowship with the most high okay now there's a physical death meaning when the soul departs from the body but that soul still goes on it still continues but death is a separation being separated from the life sustenance which the most high when he made man he when he breathed into him, he became another living soul so the most high prepared a place for all the souls to go and because the soul is eternal and it lives, it, does, it just doesn't cease to exist. The Most High and, uh, you know, in his infinite wisdom, he, he had prepared 
everything, for every, how would you say, for every scenario, he's a, in, in, like I said, in his infinite wisdom, his perfect, his infallible word, which without error, without mistake, he knew how to get straight to the crux or to the root of whatever the issue was, something that would be done that this is the repayment for that. And the Bible tells us, and just to, you know, to make a long story short, the Bible tells us in Romans 6 and 23 that the wages of sin is death. And the book of, of, of James 1 tells us that every man is led away. The Most High tempteth no man. So the Most High didn't tempt anyone to go and sin. Man himself, remember that conscience, we have a seat of conscience. And that conscience, now you can be influenced one way or the other. But the Most High tells us that's why you have to guard your mind above all things guarded unless you become and be, begin to be influenced. So now we live in a world right now that everything that they're recording, tracking everything and putting things that, that to really go against the Creator and to really outline and to mark those who who's not for their agenda, who's not for their turn. And then they ultimately have a plan that they're trying to devise that they think in their mind that they're going to do. But the Most High, that's why I named this Israel's Deliverance. The Most High is going to, why, how do we know this? Because the Bible tells us in Matthew 24, let me show you really quick, I'll come back to this. Matthew 24, really quick. Boy, this is a good study here. Matthew 24, and I want to say verses 22, somewhere around there, if I remember correctly. Yes. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So we know that tribulation is coming. But Yeshua told us not to worry. Because he has overcome this world, and so will we. So now it's time, and those who have took the necessary procedures and did what? You ever heard of step out on faith? That's the faith that needs to be cultivated. Needs to, you need to be stirred up. You need to be reminded. Because if you see all the negativity, sometimes you look at all the negative, what the enemy doing, what they're doing. No, the Most High, he's the one that's sovereign. The Egyptians thought that they was never, that, you know, that Egypt would never ever end from being a superpower, but yet they did. And not only that, once they were, once they got ended, and the Most High dealt them a severe blow, the other enemies of the Most High's people sought for a chance to conspire and get together and rally together and say, "Let us, let us destroy these people before they come into their power, before they come into their glory." So this is, the, this is the, the thing that we need to be in the season of petitioning the Most High. At least those who have uh, some level of, you know, of seriousness. Seriousness about praying for the Most High's will. Even if you don't know what that is. Say, Most High, I want your will to be done. Who, it doesn't matter about, you know, when I say it doesn't matter, uh, it doesn't, like, like let's say if, if, if I'm black and, and they're white or they're white and I'm black, most high, your people, those who you intended for salvation, I want to pray. I pray that I'm on the right side of you in judgment. Stick with me. Going back to the video, about another 30 seconds of this. Fair use. How do feel about this country and how they're treated? See? Listen. Where do we hear that at? We heard that in Exodus 1. The king, a new, a new king rose, a new pharaoh who knew not the kindness that Joseph had did. So there's people, now I, I must mind you also, there's been hundreds of thousands of people fired that were American citizens who had good paying jobs and the merchants said, okay, well listen, we're firing you. We now have another group of people, another populace of people who are willing to work and will not complain, who don't mind working Oh, they don't, who don't care about no sick days off or whatever the case is. They come from a harsher environment. And you know what? You know, they want, they want an opportunity. They want access at what? America, the American dream. So there's people who have been stepped on, overlooked, and yet you have some people at the very 
top who say, sort of like the sentiment that we're hearing in this particular video, let's, let's let the past be the past and let's forget about that and let's move on. But the Most High doesn't, doesn't do things. He doesn't forget. A thousand years is as a day with the Most High. So the Most High said, beware unless you forget. So imagine having someone uh, doing, and this is the world that you and I actually live in right now. We need the Most High. These is, sometimes we look at some of these inventors and some of these uh, business moguls or world leaders and uh, you know, people of high IQ as, as saviors to, to the world's problem. When really, they're behind the scene the minions into the enemy. The enemy don't care about no money. He wants to get back out into the heavens, right? He wants to be like the most high and to be the most high, the most high alone is the one to be worshiped. Like we started this off, like the angel told John the revelator, see it thou, do us it not. Don't worship me, worship the most high for the testimony, okay? And for the spirit of prophecy that, that Yeshia is the spirit of prophecy, but uh, let's get back to what, 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 is, what this uh, video is saying. Fair use. Color and even trans people. Um, Notice how, how you threw that in there. This country and how they're treated in this country. If they, if they say and they believe that they are treated a certain way in this country, why don't you believe them? You, you, you cannot have a situation where, where someone is, is a self-described victim and, and, they, and they just get to be that because that's how they feel. I think that that does happen in some cases. But not all cases. And I think that not understanding the history of the country, I think, is, um, is a, a real that some That some cases would be the real victims were those who were forced and, and suffered a judgment. Suffered a judgment that the Most High placed upon them. As a matter of fact, I got to show, because this, you know, this is a Bible-based ministry. And uh, when you look at uh, Deuteronomy 28, right? In verses, I want to say 48, if I remember correctly. That's what I believe it is. Deuteronomy, that these would be on you for a sign. It might be at 46, but Deuteronomy 28. And let's go right around 46. Yes. Let's go from 45. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed because thou hearkenest not that means thou did not listen thou did not obey the voice of the most high thy god the bible tells us here in first samuel 15 and 22 i want to go there really quick first i'm gonna come right back to this one first samuel 15 quickly and 22 And Samuel said, have the most high as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the most high? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken, that means to listen, to take heed, to do is better than the fat of rams. Verse 23, for the rebellion for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So now we live in a time where the whole world is promoting this. They're promoting rebellion against the one true living God. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So one can, again, feel in themselves and have an opinion that they might be self proclaim victims and you know we don't want to play the role as a victim right and sit there and cry a victim and cry you know cry wolf no we leave our uh how do you say this our our, our vengeance because the bible tells us that vengeance belongs to the most high right in hebrews uh 10 and verses 30 and 31 we know him who said vengeance belongeth to me said the most high so he's going and yet the most high will recompense and guess what the most high don't care how rich how powerful uh how famous how cute how smart 
He don't care about none of that. He's concerned with those who did what? Kept his law. He don't, he don't even care about those who claim victim. And he, listen, he don't. He will hear that. Not to say that he that he's overlooking that, but let's say someone claims victim, but they're evil and they're wicked in their heart. That's what I'm getting at. It's better to obey the most high. Okay. So it says, again, stubbornness is as the iniquity of idolatry. You know, you might as well be an idolater. Fair use. Damn. Look, I've had but you're I've had incredible history. opportunities in other countries. I've had incredible opportunities as a person of color. Right, but I've also been very well. But I've also been discriminated against, and I know that I have, and I know that that's real. And for someone to say that that isn't happening, I should not. I should just move forward and not think about that and ignore the past is insulting. Let's stop right there. So, in other words, this is now if we as people, uh, Don. Don Lemon, the gentleman here that's doing the interview with Elon Musk, if those two individuals are people and they can recognize insult, think about how insulting that mankind has been to the one who has created, who created the man and have been unmindful to his blessings. So let's get back into some more of the study here. So you see that, dear family, the scripture told us that the sons of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, and all that despise thee shall bow themselves down, Isaiah 60 and 14, shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet, and they shall call thee the city of the Most High, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Going over to Jeremiah 16 and 14 now, the Most High will restore Israel. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Most High Ahiah, that I should that excuse me, that it shall no more be said, the Most High liveth, that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Most High liveth, that brought up the children of Israel, what, from the land of the north and from all the lands whither he had driven them, and I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their for, or, or gave to their fathers. Now, remember I said I was going to go back to uh, Deuteronomy 28 and 45. I want to get that really quick. So Deuteronomy 28 and 45 through 47 tells us, Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not to the voice of the Most High thy God. Didn't listen to keep his commandments, read that again, to keep his commandments and the statutes which he commanded thee, 46, and they shall be upon thee. So these things shall be upon thee, these curses shall come upon thee, pursue thee and overtake thee. They'll be upon thee for a sign and a wonder and upon thy seed forever. So it is correct when the, 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 uh, the journalist was saying that, you know, he has... Uh, face discrimination or whatnot, okay? Nonetheless, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't negate, it doesn't negate, uh, you know, the fact that he is also, you know, he has benefited from the system, dear family. And, and that's not the voice. He's not the voice. He's not the voice of the Most High's people. Michelle. At the door? Yeah, it's okay. okay. He's not the voice for the Most High, High's people. Okay. He's not connecting the dots. Okay. It's, it's like both of them, they, you know, he, he has an axe to, to grind. So look what it says in verse 47. Because thou servest not the Most High thy power with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. See that? You can go out there and shut the door. Because Israel didn't, 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 uh, didn't serve the Most High for the joy of all things. Right? So can you shut the door, please? Look what 48 says. 
Therefore shall thou serve thy enemies, which the Most High shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. And so they'll be looking, we'll be looking at those who've gotten high above us for help, for a helping hand. And look what it says. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. So this is what prophecy says, right? See that? That's biblical. But again, most people are not just, you know, the people in the interview, most people want to just totally eradicate and erase this. But let's let's, let's see. Let's see. This ain't the first time they did this. We'll play a little bit of this right here. Fair use. Farmers and other black landowners have repeatedly been targeted to have their property taken. Hi, my name is Alina, and I would like... One second. Become. Of course, the white supremacists wouldn't let that happen. But what if we told you that this exact order would be worth at least $6.4 trillion today? Slavery made America wealthy, and racist policies have been blocking black people from building wealth for years. Its impact can still be felt today. Farmers and other black landowners have repeatedly been targeted to have their property taken. Do you think that you would have been that much further ahead if you were one of your white counterparts? Oh yes, we, we would not have lost the land. We would have gotten the loans and the services that all farmers should get through the government. The question is, how would these reparations look now? People can't just seize land without compensation. This is not the reconstruction period. The 40 acres and a mule promised black people that the Georgian coast and South Carolina would be left to them. Basically, a huge chunk of the South included the land that stretched from Charleston to the St. Johns River in Florida. The area was so massive that it would have had a detrimental impact on American families. There is no way to get that land back, even if it used to belong to Black people. Does that mean reparations should be done via bond investments of their current values and then divide them between the descendants of slaves? Some people want land, others want money. But black families have been denied justice so many times because the laws were set against them. How will we solve the racial wealth gap and the damage it has done? Based on recent statistics, almost six in 10 black adults say their ancestors were enslaved. That is 57% of the population. Roughly four in 10 said their ancestors were enslaved in the United States. When black people fought and bled for their freedom, a lot of white people who lived in rural areas hated the way the- and I can say that, like for me, like, cause my mom showed me some of the, the pictures of, like that she got from her relatives and ancient, I mean, it's ancient, old pictures, dear family. So this is true. But notice what they're saying, that the, the move now, notice in the school, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for those who actually, at the hand of, to those who actually inflicted and did this, but the Most High is saying, and those who are truly are repentant or, or repentative, or, or I say repentive, or sorry about it and, and owning up for it, then, you know, the only way that they can do that, the scripture says, if the wicked give back the pledge, you got to give back what you stole, according to scriptures, though, but if they don't do that, then understand that there's no peace with them in the Most High and understand that at the helm of this, we would see that there is actually a group of people who have a vested interest of trying to destroy, you know, the Most High's heritage. But it's the Most High that's fighting for Israel and Israel will be delivered and, and it's being delivered. Every time we prophesy, every time that we pray, every time that you know, that we hold in the feast days. Heaven 
it's bearing record to it, okay? More people are seeing and, you know, lives are being changed. People are coming out of this, uh, what you would call idolatry and these false, false ways of worshiping the Most High God, the one true living power, and coming back and searching for the paths of righteousness uh, or, or the paths where righteousness is to walk in. Let me play some more of this, fair use. The union waged war in the South. Look there this. was death on all sides. The common people suffered the most because of politics. Politics is poisonous. It creates a vicious cycle of hatred, anger, and resentment. It divides people. It makes them bitter and cynical. Wealthy white planters were able to redirect that hatred toward black people. And it just so happens to be right now in 2024, this is about where it's at. If you, if the parameters that, that the fillers that are out there, this is what people are talking about with politics and stuff. You have people talking, saying that this group of people, you can't say anything about this group of people. These group of people have a monopoly and they're, they're flexing their muscles and they're flexing all of their, uh, economic might and all the sanctionings and, and doing this to anyone that uh, opposes them. You get what I'm saying? And on, a, on, a, on the other side, you have those who have been oppressed and who's at the behest and they're trying to find it. And then you have people who want to be in the middle ground who want nothing to do with it at all. Are you seeing this? Maybe you don't feel it. Maybe some people, again, to each his own, you know, if you will, some people, you have the, that's your prerogative. You choose to put your head in the sand and don't want to look at, you can do that. No one can, no one can force you to see or to hear anything. But know that the Most High God, He is bearing witness to this. Heaven's bearing witness to this, to all the wickedness and all the innocent blood that have been spilled in the earth. And those who are bearing rule right now who have never, listen to me, who have never been brought to justice. The Most High being holy, Him being holy means that He will not allow, okay, any of His subjects, even the wicked. The Bible says in the, in the book of Proverbs 16 and 4, let me show it to you really quick. Look at this. Same way that He, that he did Pharaoh, but watch this. Proverbs 16 and 4 says what? The Most High created all things. The Most High made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. So the Most High is going to pour out his wrath. He's going to have his way, dear family. Let me hit play on this a little bit more. Fair use. With the help of the Ku Klux Klan. So even if slavery was officially abolished, the South was still going to be a hostile and dangerous environment for every single black person who lived there. The 40 acres and the mule was going to change everything. Here is what historian Eric Foner wrote about in his book, Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution. Here in coastal South Carolina and Georgia, the prospect beckoned of a transformation of Southern society more radical even than the end of slavery. Can you imagine how different our lives would have been if this promise actually came true? There would be no racial wealth gap and the structure of the black family would have come out stronger than ever. First of all, this nation was built on the backs of black families. It all started with more than two centuries of legal slavery, which had a ripple effect years after that. It stripped black people of their wealth, liberty, and basic human rights. It was slavery that created modern day capitalism and made the United States one of the wealthiest countries. At the time of the Civil War, about 4 million black people were still in... So 200 years of what they deemed legal, legal slavery. So I wanted to go there. This is, you know, this is about, a, about 20 more minutes to watch. I don't have the time to watch all this right now. Um, but I may, I may, uh, let me say this. I may resort back to this uh, this document here, or what would you call it, uh, this video, and uh, at a later time. But I want to get back over to these scriptures. Notice what happened. So I'm, I'm painting that picture because I'm getting ready to read something to us that's very, very pertinent. Because notice that what they said that that would have that wealth had my ancestors were able to get that and keep that to keep that wealth, but what happened is they reneged on it. If you watch more of the video, they reneged on it and said, we're not giving, giving the black people nothing. And they had other migrant, other people come in, and then they gave them the stuff and gave them 
certain things, other poor people, other ethnic groups, but not the the people who were who uh, were originally harmed and forced into the descendants of those who had lived, died, and enslaved in America. Didn't give their descendants anything. Who still broken the families, right? So the scripture tells us that in Zechariah 11 and 5. It says that they hold themselves, who oppressors hold themselves guiltless. So they said they did nothing. So look at this right here. But the most high, so the, the saying is that, look at this. So now that the world know that the real children of Israel were putting the pieces, that the most high himself is putting the pieces of the puzzles. He's showing the world who has an eye, who could you stomach it? It, it hurts. Could you imagine your ancestors being responsible for, for doing some of the things that, that were, that you, you're actually descendants? And so people do stick with family, whatever the case is. But listen, the Most High tells his sons and his daughters, he tells his priests, you're not to sigh on the side of the wicked at any cost. It doesn't matter if it's your own family. It doesn't matter if it's you. You do justice and judgment. That's what the Most High says. So we got to be on the side of the Most High. So it says here in Jeremiah 16 and verses 15, it's going to come to pass, but the Most High liveth that brought the children of Israel from the land of the north, that's right, North America, and from the lands whither he had driven them, South America, right, you would call uh, the Caribbeans, right, all the, what's going on over in Haiti, right, and, the, and, and what do they call those areas over there, um, uh, it slips my mind right now, but, and I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishes, saith the Most High, and they shall fish them. And after will I send for many hunters. So at first he's fishing. After that, the Most High is going to send up. Remember, Yeshua is coming with that army. He's coming with, with hunters and warriors. And they shall hunt them from... from they shall hunt them from every from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. Remember, they're building bunkers to go down into the rocks. Hide me from the face of him who sits on the on the throne. Okay, and from his judgment. 17 says, For my eyes are upon all their ways, they are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from my eyes. And I wanted to go over into Job 16. And just to show you some of the sentiment that Job was saying that the comfort of, of mankind, of his peers, is like they're, they're, they're bad comforters, right? And I want to point your attention to verses 4. It says here in Job 16 and 4, I also could speak as ye do, if your soul were in my soul stead, I could heap up words against you, see, and shake my head at you. But, so he's saying, but. He said, I would strengthen you with my mouth and the moving of my lips should uh, assuage your grief. So in other words, hold back your grief. Though I speak, my grief is not assuaged or excuse me, assuaged. And though I forbear, patiently wait, am I eased? So he said, I'm bearing all this grief and yet I'm having, having a hard time. So he said, if this, if what happened to me happened to you, I could have spoken like, like you guys, but you don't really understand. So in other words, you, unless you've been through it, you could never really fully understand. So it's best to take a, a humble place and say, well, I don't know what that's like. I have no idea, but, but just being, if you will, being a person, I understand if someone was wrong. If you know what it's like to be betrayed or, or know what it's like to have injustice done to you, you could you, there's no way that you could imagine it on the scale that we as a people, as God's people, have endured. See? And so this is what, again, in Christianity, everyone is put on a, a, a on the even field that is, listen, you're gonna come and march into the kingdom by just saying that you that you believe in Christ. When you haven't suffered the, the affliction that Christ's people have have suffered and are experiencing okay so job 20 talks about uh it talks about the uh it talks about the the the, the judgment that the most high pours out upon the wicked now i want to go over to here 
and talk about this Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay, now we're coming to this close here in about maybe 20, 30 minutes. And on the 15th day of that month, of the first month, is the Most High's Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yesterday at sundown, Friday at sundown, begin the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For seven days you must eat bread made without, excuse me, made without yeast. So immediately following the Passover was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This was a seven-day feast commemorating the day Israel left Egypt. That's right. See? Israel left Egypt. Israel delivered their deliverance at the command of the Most High. So again, we see that this feast is to be celebrated as an eternal ordinance for the generations to come. Now, I want to point your attention to the book of Exodus, chapter 17, because in a second, I'm going to read and uh, read some history from the book of Josephus, book three, chapter two. And we'll read about after how the Hebrews. Matter of fact, we'll go there first and then we'll come. We'll double back to the book of Exodus. Let's read this. Josephus. Book 3, chapter 2, how the Amalekites and the neighboring nations made war with the Hebrews and were beaten and lost a great part of their army. So Israel being delivered mean that the armies and the people who was against them, who, who, who made themselves their adversaries against God's elect, they suffered a blow from the Most High. It says here, paragraph 1, Chapter 2, the name of the Hebrews began already to be everywhere renowned, and rumors about them ran abroad. This made the inhabitants of those countries to be in no small fear. Accordingly, they sent ambassadors to one another and exhorted one another to defend themselves and to endeavor to destroy these men. Those that induced the rest to do so were such as inhabited Gobalitis in Petra, okay? They were called Amalekites and were the most warlike of the nations that lived thereabout. And those kings exhorted one another and their neighbors to go to war against the Hebrews, telling them that an army, listen to this, an army of strangers and such a one as had run away from slavery under the Egyptians. Are you seeing the comparisons? Are you seeing this family? Watch this. Are you seeing the comparisons? Slavery. That was about 13% of the total American population. The demand for cotton was massive. Cotton production in the U.S. went up from just a couple of thousand Fair tons use. at the turn of the 19th century to well over 1.6 million and 4.3 million tons through most of the 20th century. The rich industrialists saw the perfect opportunity to profit off poor rural blacks. Black folks were fed up with the inner workings of the slave society. They wanted to build a new place for themselves and their families. They wanted to actively confront racial prejudice as well as social, political, and economic challenges for the years to come. In other words, they knew that emancipation wouldn't give formerly enslaved people any real economic freedom. It would just keep them stuck in a broken system, a system that will do whatever it takes to keep black folks at the bottom of society. They needed something else, something that had the power to shape the entire nation to its core if it ever came to be. On January 12, 1865, Black leaders had a meeting at the Green Meldrin House with other military officials. They said that white people were impossible to live with. Black families. Are you hearing this? So in other words, back at the time when Israel left out of Egypt and they're making their way, it said around Petra, that's over what you call by, by, by Jordan and right around where, where, where Edom, where Edom was, right, in the south. So it says here that these Amalekites were the most warlike of the nations that lived thereabout, 
in whose kings exhorted one another and their neighbors to go to this war against Hebrew against the Hebrews, telling them that an army of strangers. Now, what I just showed you there from that clip is that you that you had, uh, you know, military or, or people of of, uh, of the ethnic race of the Hebrews in this particular land. Okay, the original, which are the original people. I don't like to say indigenous, but they're the original people, and they had went to you know they they were enlisted and they fought in in the wars right they were told that they would be given freedom for some of the brits said listen fight for us and listen you fight for us then we'll give you freedom you can come over here and to to uh what they call the uk or or, or to britain and we'll treat you better than <laughs> what what the land of your captivity is okay so some people took it upon them and they you know took that offer up but others who fought for the, the country that they lived in, they fought and were put on the front line to only come back to say, oh, listen, we need, it's, it's impossible to, to have what you would call a, uh, if you will, inclusion. They said that they, maybe it was a good thing that they would be segregated or separated and set apart from Caucasian people or white people. That's what they were saying, right? And they said here, so, and in 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 the in the Josephus is telling us that that the Amalekites tried to stir up all the other peoples and said that listen these people came out an army of strangers and such a one as had run away from slavery under the Egyptians see they're saying listen the those slaves the, the Egyptian slaves have now got free let us pounce I'm gonna give you let me let me let me paraphrase and give you in the synopsis. Let us destroy them, okay, before they ever can put two and two together and really become a force to, to be reckoned with. They knew it. So it says that they lay in wait to ruin them, which army they were not, and common prudence in regard to their own safety to overlook, but to crush them before they gather strength and come to be in prosperity. So what was the thing we we're reading or what we're seeing here on this? That the U.S. in modern times, as you know, 100 years ago or so, not even 100 years ago, you know, maybe seven uh, decades ago or whatever, that they put in their policies to never allow the quote unquote black family to have any economical strength. Right. Listen to this. We're afraid that it would take years for society to get rid of their racial prejudice and provide a comfortable place for black folks to live in. What do you want for your people? This is what William T. Sherman Listen. asked the 20 pastors who came to the mansion. This has never happened before. It was the very first time government officials had asked black people what they wanted for their future and the future of their Fair family. use. Rather than live among white folks, black people wanted to have their own land. This meant it was time to redistribute the land of rich plantation owners in the South. Here is what Reverend Garrison Frank... Now, now get the mindset. Now here in the 21st century, it may be different, okay? In, in certain parts. And sometimes when he says, when, when it, things change, when they say things change, sometimes they stay more of the same. Like in the South of the U.S., you know, with the South, there's rural areas where the people are straight up segregated still, or, you know, they stick within the, amongst themselves because the reality and the scars of the trauma and the things that have happened there, it, it really, you know, it, it, it goes to the core, to the root of the quote unquote, civil, the, civilized, the civilized government of, of the U.S., right? It goes to the core that these things that have happened that have befallen people, that their descendants are still suffering from the pain and they have on their books and in writing things that, that promises that they made and then retracted and, re, and, 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 and reneged on that. And so people have lived and died, come and gone, and, and lies that were per, uh, perpetuated and put up. So... Now we live in, in a time right now where all this stuff, it's all coming open, that, that prophecy that the Most High God, the God, the Holy One of Israel, He has the final say in all this, right? So listen, listen to this here. 
Frazier said, he was a spokesman and Baptist minister for the group. The way we can best take care of ourselves is to have land and turn it and till it by our own labor. We so, want so what they were saying that that general at that particular time, he met with those pastors and said, well, what is it that you guys need? What did you want? And they, they told him, the 20 pastors said, well, listen, we do need our own stuff. We want to live, be in peace with ourselves, protect ourselves because they didn't want to be amongst, you know, uh, amongst the Caucasians at that time that were doing what? Who were, uh, and not to say that there wasn't poor white people during those times because there were poor people, but in other words, they're saying that, listen, these the the, the the that that the caucasians who are in government or the local sheriffs and so forth and so on these these people continue to do what try to destroy and threaten their safety and the peace of their family so they said well listen we we need we need something for our own and it might be just good for you guys to be over there and do your thing we won't bother you don't bother us but the thing is the mindset of those who actually benefited from it. They're like, you, you actually had some, some, uh, you know, poor Caucasian people that was like, well, wait, we're better than them. At least we weren't slaves, right? That's the mindset. So they begin to have a, a superior, how do you say it? Sup superiority complex. And some people have that. That was ingrained and embedded in them. And so the people who was out working and wanted better for their families, they, brothers and sisters, they put their lives on the line. You get what I'm saying? And imagine those pastors that was able to read the book and open the scripture and say, my goodness. See that? So all this was kept, all this was kept under, uh, under, under lock and key. Don't let this get out. Okay? Because if this get out and these people get, get, get free to their God, and you know if, if the if they're civilized or the world because this is supposed to be a civilized country if other world and we're supposed to be what you would call the standard for being civilized and treating people fair what business have we saying in any other country's uh government's affairs if we ourselves have done you know have been tyrants and 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 done you know done atrocities to to a group of people and, and never and never righted our wrong. See, that's the issue. Want to be placed on land until we are able to buy it Fair and use. make it our own. Just a couple of days later, on January 16, 1865, okay. Sherman gave a special field order 15 that stated 400,000 acres of property to be confiscated from Confederate landowners and be given to Black Americans. Mules were not part of the order. However, the union. Could you imagine those people, the Confederate? You know what that is. Those are people who were for slavery and enslaving, you know, you, yours, and my ancestors. They was like, you gonna, you gonna, you gonna take our land and give it to, <laughs> give it to the people, uh, the descendants of the people who we enslaved, and how we got this wealth. They, you, they were, you know, they wasn't having it, you know, they wasn't. For that turn, they wouldn't have. They wasn't too happy about that. The army provided some as part of the effort. Now let's make this clear: mules were not part of the order. However, the Union Army provided some as part of the effort. Now let's make this clear: Sherman was not an abolitionist. The idea to redistribute the land came from Edwin M. Stanton. He was a Secretary of War at the time. Today we call it the Forty Acres and a Mule. But have you read the order itself? That's where things get interesting. This is how AG1 works to up. Says the islands near Charleston, abandoned rice fields by the rivers, and land along the St. John's River in Florida are set aside and reserved for black Americans who have been freed because of the war and the president's proclamation. Section two says, the people who will settle the land can make their own communities. Black people would govern these communities. Here is an excerpt from the order itself. On the islands and in the settlements hereafter to be established, no white person whatsoever, unless military officers and soldiers detailed for duty will be permitted to reside. And the sole and exclusive management of affairs will be left to the free people themselves. 
by the laws of war and orders of the President of the United States. The Negro is free and must be dealt with as such. Section 3 gives us even more details. Each black family will get their own land, not more than 40 acres that they can cultivate. If the land is next to a water channel, they can have up to 800 feet of waterfront. The military will make sure they are safe until there comes a time when these people can do it on their own or Congress officially settles their ownership rights. Nothing was in the order about people getting a mule with the land. However, some families did receive mules from the army because the army had excess mules that were left from the war. Not only would this order give black people a better life, but it would also break the power dynamic that slaveholders in the South held. The power that shaped the country and the way society viewed black people. Everything was going according to plan. The Union generals divided plantations into smaller settlements so black Americans could make use of them. Those who settled there started working on their land right away. About 1,000 people settled on Georgia's Skidaway Island. By June, 40,000 out of... Fair use. So, I mean, I've always heard of it, but I've never had this information like this, like, like fluently taught, you know, taught to me or told to me. See? Never, never heard it. It was never presented, but yet, yet it's there. Like I said, this, this is the information that was you know, under lock and key, right? Don't get this information out. And not only that, but as we're, as I'm sitting here, I'm connecting this to what the Most High says. When you look at the scriptures, can you see, can you see the resemblance? Of four million freed slaves received their end of the bargain. But well, you guessed it, the public was furious. They literally lost it. Confederate sympathizers and rich Southerners believed that General Sherman was out of line. The land that he promised to the black people was not his to give. It still belonged to the plantation owners, so it had to be revoked. If the government wouldn't do it the easy way, they would do it the hard way. That's exactly what happened. Lincoln was assassinated on April 15, 1865. President Andrew Johnson revoked the field order, and the promise was broken. Confederate owners got their land back but they also got hungrier and thirsty for revenge. They wanted to make sure that black Americans would never put them in the same situation again. From 1887 to 1892, nine states enforced laws that would segregate America. It was the start of the Jim Crow era. A farmer without a market to sell to will never become economically independent. They would need to work more and for less money. Wow, a farmer without a market. So in other words, if you don't have the customers or the people who need any of your supplies and they put into, you know, put sanctions, don't buy from them, then by default, you would still be at the behest of, of you know, the ruling class. And not only that, you had to, like I just said, you had to work all day hard as you can just to to make a to pay a bill have you ever sat back and thought about that imagine working your whole life and some people just get things just given to them and they've wasted it some people work all that they can and as hard as they can and somehow some way the system still finds a way to to, to have them die with nothing to, with no inheritance to give to their you know to their offspring but leave them in debt and the Most High sees all this, dear family, and this is the thing that, the you know that that's uncomfortable with the world at large. And so the, again, there's some people who play victim, and state certain things, but there's others who actually live through this nightmare, through these atrocities, uh, through this tyranny, through this being tortured, right? So now, now imagine adding it how they how they did it now, because again, Israel was never supposed to go and serve the Most High like the other nations did okay they were always supposed to be set apart and in, 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 you know in sacred unto the most high be holy let me go back over here to the passage of, of the study here in the josephus so we're here at uh what was it book three chapter two and it says again so the amalekites said let's crush them before they gather strength and come in to be in prosperity See the resemblance like what I just showed you there? And perhaps 
attack them first in a hostile manner, as presuming upon their in how do you say indolence in not attacking them before, and that we ought to avenge ourselves of them for what they have done in the wilderness, but that this cannot be so well done when they have once laid their hands on our cities and our goods. See that? That those who endeavor to crush a power in its first rise are wiser than those that endeavor to put it to put a stop to its progress when it has become formidable. So they're saying before you ever have a leg to stand on, I'm gonna snatch the rug right up from under your feet. You'll never get it, you'll never see it coming. So now look at who who do we have now in Israel? The most high is fighting for us. For these last seem to be angry only at the flourishing of others, but the former do not leave any room for their enemies to become troublesome to them. After they had sent such, uh, how do you say this, ambassages to the neighboring nations and among one another, they resolved to attack the Hebrews in battle. So they said, let us go ahead and destroy them. Now what happened? They just left. Yeah. They left Egypt on the 15th during the Feast of Passover or Unleavened Bread. And as they're celebrating before the Most High on their journeys, this is what they run into, dear family. Verse 2, these proceedings, verse two, excuse me, uh, chapter or, or paragraph 2 of chapter 2, all right? Book 3, chapter 2, paragraph 2 of the Josephus. These proceedings of the people of those countries occasions perplexities and trouble to Masha, who expected no such warlike preparations. He's like, I'm not trying to war. We don't plan on doing any harm to the Amalekites or any other uh, uh, ethnic groups that are around at that time. And when these nations were ready to fight and the multitude of the Hebrews were obliged to try the fortune of war, they were in a mighty disorder and in want of all necessi excuse me, necessaries. And yet were to make war with men who were thoroughly well prepared for it. So they were going, the people who after leaving Egypt, they weren't, how do you say this, in the ranks of a military uh, format, right? They didn't send their sons off to boot. Remember, some of them, they were, they were in Egypt working and, and being made to treat, you know, uh, used with, with, with uh, what you would call rigor. Now, some of them, but they, they had no military. They had no standing army. So what they did to those who maybe did fight in the Egyptian army or whatever the case is and was in parts of ranks in that. Now they're using everything that they had to, for the, how would you say it, for the preservation, self-preservation. And not only that, but having the assistance of the Most High. So they didn't have the top-notch spears and they didn't have the, what do you call it there, the chariots and and, and, and horses that to you know what I'm saying to to, to stampede into to to, uh, to to battle, the Egyptians who had all that they had that the Amalekites they had all that, the Ammonites and all the other people the Moabites that was around that area they had that, the Jebusites and so forth and so on they had that and they were coming to do what to crush Israel before they were had a leg to stand on, and it says here. Then, therefore, it was Masha, or Moses, began to encourage them and to exhort them to have a good heart and rely on the Most High's assistance, by which they had been state, which they had been state of freedom. How does it say it? By which they had been state of freedom and to hope for victory over those who were ready to fight with them. That's the same thing that we have to do now in order to deprive them of that blessing. So the people were coming to fight with them in order to deprive them of the blessing. That it's the Most High that fights for us, Israel. That they were supposed, that they were to suppose that, they were supposed, they were, excuse me, read this again. 
that they were to suppose their own army to be numerous, lacking or wanting nothing, neither weapons, nor money, nor provision, nor such other, other conveniences as when men are in possession of, they fight undauntedly. In other words, when you're in the possession of having these things, you fight very valiantly. And that they are to judge themselves to have all these advantages in the divine assistance or the supernatural assistance. They are also to suppose their enemy's armies to be small, unarmed, weak, and such as want those conveniences which they know must be wanted when it is the most high's will that they shall be beaten so the army that was coming with all of the, they were outgunned you know they had the logistics they knew the the terrain they knew the area right they had others which you would call accompanying them they had uh what would you call the allies they stirred up all the other people. Listen, let's come and fight against these people. Didn't you hear what these people did? These people wiped out a, like two of them took out a whole city. So if these people ever, so they gave a bad report and made people who had nothing, that, who had no fight or, or, or no dog in the fight against the Hebrews to stir them up to be adversaries against our ancestors, the Hebrews or the Israelites, God's chosen people. And it says, read that last sentence again. So they are, to they are to suppose their enemy's army to be small, un unarmed, weak, and such as want those conveniences which they know must want be wanted when it is the Most High's will that they shall be beaten and how valuable the Most High's assistance is. They had experienced an abundance of trials. That's what you and I, I, I know I'm experiencing that. I'm experiencing it. I'm experiencing the most highs assistance in the trials of life because it's hard being a righteous man, especially being in, in this world a, a black man. Straight up. Like that that guy said that he he uh, he he experienced discrimination. I've certainly experienced discrimination, but I'm not playing that and using that as a as a as a uh as a card to, to play victim as some people who've never experienced that might be, oh, you're just playing. When they hear about someone of myself, my ethnicity talking, you're just playing victim again. No, I'm not. I mean, if you see that I had a business, a, one of the business, a business that through that particular business would end up bringing wealth to me and to my family and to understand that the things that have happened and not have certain things afforded to me that were afforded to others when I tried. You get what I'm saying? I know that I know that it's something supernatural. I know that it's all to the good. The Most High is going to give back to me. And, and, and still, even the things that I have, He's still providing for me. Now, I have that testimony. I know it now. It's not a fluke. It's not a, oh, it's just a hunch. And that's a guess. No, I know that this system, I know what it did. I've seen peers get washed in the system. People lose their lives. People put their hope in it. So my hope is in the Most High Ahaya, in, in the salvation that he's bringing through his son, Yeshia. So stand on point. So they had experienced the assistance of the Most High in abundance of trials in those such as were more terrible than war. For that is only against men. War is only against men. But these were against famine and thirst. Things indeed that are in their own nature in, how do you say that? Superable, insuperable, superable. As also against mountains, they had to travel up ways that, it was, you know, it's hard to travel. And that sea, which afforded them no way for escaping, yet had all these difficulties been conquered by the Most High's gracious kindness to them. So he exhorted them to be courageous at this time and to look upon their entire prosperity to depend on the present conquest of their enemies. Read that again. So he exhorted them to be courageous at this time and to look upon their entire prosperity 
to depend on the present conquest of their enemies. In other words, it's going to go well. We're getting ready to go up against these people who are not for our turn, but you're going to come out all right. Paragraph three. And with these words did Masha encourage the multitude who then called together the princes of their tribes and the chief men, both separately and conjointly. The young men, he charged to obey their elders. Now you're getting order. You can't be. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? So even the young people had to know that, wait a minute, the Most High is getting ready to wipe out the adversary. These people are trying to destroy us. They're not for our turn. Do not allow the dainties of the Gentiles to enter into your mind and then you put off these great promises that the Most High has given to you as Israel. He's going to deliver you from captivity. And the elders to hearken to their leader. So the people were elevated in their minds and they were stimulated and ready to try their fortune in battle and hope to be thereby at length delivered from all their miseries. Nay, they desired that Moses would immediately lead them against their enemies without the least delay, that no backwardness might be a hindrance to their present resolution. So Meshach sorted all that were fit for war into different troops and set Joshua, the son of Nun, of the tribe of Ephraim, over them, one that was of great courage. So Ephraim are the Puerto Ricans, okay? And patient, and so he was one that was what? He was one of great courage and patient to undergo labors. So in other words, when he had it hard in life, he didn't sit there and stump off and poke his mouth. Nothing's going my way. I'm going to cry. He didn't do that. He said, you know what? When life gave us lemons, we made lemonade. We're going to take this hard situation and it's going to, we're going to, we're going to see our way through this. So he was, he was patient to undergo labors of great abilities to understand. So he would look at things and he would begin to understand, to see. One has to have a peripheral vision. You have to look steps ahead. You have to look at the hazards. You have to look at the risks versus the reward. You have to see, well, wait a minute. Do I have what's sufficient enough to go to war or do I have enough endurance to resist this enemy that is coming against me do i have enough faith am, am, am i that am i that faithful to endure and to believe in the most high to even if i get destroyed i'm going to stand on the side of the most high then to lower my standard in the ways that the Most High had showed my forefathers. I'll, I'll die honorably than to die the death of a coward. Say a coward dies a thousand times. I'm going to keep what the Most High said. So he said he wasn't going to tuck tail and run. So he was of great abilities to understand, praise Ahiah, and to speak what was proper Okay, and to speak what was proper and very serious and what? Worship of the Most High. So he wasn't just sitting there talking. He knew that he was a true, he was a servant of the Most High God, likened unto to Meshach, just like him. He told people, listen, you serve the Most High God. Don't you bring no filth amongst us because when you set, when, if, if, you're, if you're scared, then the person next to you is going to be scared. So if you're scared, go ahead and go on home then. Right? If you're not going to, don't, don't, don't even uh, uh, for a second, don't be intimidated because you see the armies with all their ingenuity, all their weaponry. Our God fights for us. We have righteousness on our side. We have the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He believed. 
and indeed made like another Moses a teacher of piety. Do you know what piety means? It means reverence. In this day and age, and nowadays, dear family, people lack reverence. They lack reverence. Children, some children don't have the reverence of their parents and the things that they do. The world, the society makes it like that. But there was a time in this earth where people had true reverence, not just to their parents, but they had reverence to the Most High God, reverence to the men, to the people of God. Now, people only reverence, meaning having honor to take something serious, okay, have respect for that which they're trying to do and what they're trying to get. And if it goes against what they want and what they're feeling that they want to do, then they have, they have no piety. So he was a teacher of piety towards the Almighty. He also, he also appointed a small party of armed men to be near the water and to take care of the children and women. That's what Israel has to do. And of the entire camp. So that the whole night they prepared themselves for the battle. They took their weapons, if any of them had such as were well made, and attended to their commanders as ready to rush forth, like our forefather Judah. Okay, ready to rush forth to the battle as soon as Mashah should give the word of command. Mashah also kept awake teaching Joshua after what manner he should order his camp. But when the day began, Masha called for Joshua again and exhorted him to approve himself. Indeed, such a one as such a one as his reputation, I think there's a typing here, as a, as his reputation, as a reputation made, made men expect from him and to gain glory by the present expedition in the opinion of those under him. Let me move this up here. For his exploits in this battle, he also gave a particular, shh, he also gave a particular exhortation to the principal men of the Hebrews and encouraged the whole army as it stood armed before him. And when he had thus animated the army, made alive, both by his words and works, and prepared everything. He retired to a mountain and committed the army to the Most High in Joshua. That's what Mashah did. So the armies joined battle, and it came, paragraph 4, so Josephus, book 3, chapter 2, paragraph 4. And it came, and, and, and so the armies joined battle. And it came to a close fight, hand to hand, both sides showing great alac I have I'm pronouncing that right, alacrity, and encouraging one another. And indeed, while Masha stretched out his hand towards heaven, the Hebrews were too hard for the Amalekites. So why, what do we see here? And they're in war, why Moses is praying and giving honor and glory to the Most High, speaking, Most High, empower your army, your camp, Most High, to have the victory over this many, this great, vast army who's coming to wipe out your heritage, Most High. Destroy them. The Most High empowered the Hebrews. But Moses not being able to sustain his hand Thus stretched out for as often as he let down his hand, so often were his own people worsted. They mean they suffered a worse fate. Some of them got dealt a severe blow. He bade his brother Aaron and her, their sister, Miriam's husband, to stand on each side of him and take hold of his hands. Why are you doing that? And not permit his wariness to prevent it, but to assist him in the extension of his hands. When this was done, the Hebrews conquered the Amalekites by main force. 
And indeed, they had all perished unless the approach of the night had obliged the Hebrews to desist from unliving anymore or slaying anymore. So our forefathers obtained a most signal, a sign, and most seasonable victory for they not only overcame those that fought against them, but terrified also the neighboring nations and got what? Great and splendid advantages which they obtained of their enemies by their hard pains in this battle. For when they had taken the enemy's camp, they got booty for the public and for their own private families, whereas till then they had not any sort of plenty. They didn't have all the gold and all the wealth and the uh, precious garments and, and all these things and, and uh, how, how would you call it, animals and so forth and so on. So till then they had not any sort of plenty of even necessary food. So they went to war. They didn't even have, as some people have, a pantry. They didn't have a pantry full of food. They were doing it moving, as some would say. They're on their way to the promised land, and the Most High, our Heavenly Father, was with his people, with his army, because it's the Most High that goes with them before him. The aforementioned battle, when they had once got it, come on, highlighter, was also the occasion of their prosperity. See? Not only for the present, but for the future ages also, for they not only made slaves of the bodies of their enemies, in other words, made servants of them, but subdued their minds also. They no longer had what you would call the audacity, if they had such, or even the inclination, meaning the propensity, the will to even fight against the Hebrews. And after this, after this battle became terrible to all that dwelt around them, moreover they acquired a vast quantity of riches, for a great deal of silver and gold was left in the enemy's camp, as also brazen vessels, which they made common use of in their families, many utensils also that were embroidered there were of both sorts, that is, of what were waved, or weaved, excuse me, what were weaved, meaning sewn, and what were the ornaments of their armor, and other things that served for use in the family and for the fortune of their rooms. They also got the prey of their cattle and of whatsoever use, uses to follow camps. When they removed from one place to another, so the Hebrews now valued themselves upon their courage and claimed great merit for their valor, and they, and they perpetually endure, excuse me, entered themselves. So in other words, this word entered, um, let me get this word here, inured. Inured means, let me go over here and get it. Don't quite remember it here. They continually inure. They continually inured or inure. That means accustomed to something, especially something unpleasant. So endure it. So in other words, dear family, for them to go into their promised land, the scripture tells us in Acts 14 and 22, through much tribulation, we must enter into the kingdom of heaven. So if anyone tells you you're just going to float up and, and you're going to get the kingdom just because you believe and you sitting back and doing so, dear friend, you better run far from them. I would, I would encourage you to do some soul searching to read the Most High's word for yourself. Okay? So they continue to endure and go through pain-taking things by which they deemed very difficult, might be surmounted. Such were the consequences of this battle. So they had hope, dear family. So with that, we're going to go ahead and close out by reading Exodus 17, verses 8 through 16. And this is the account 
where Israel defeats the Amalekites. Okay. It says, Then came Amalek, Exodus 17 and verses 8, and fought with Israel in Rephidim. 9. And Mashal said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out to fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of the Most High in my hand. Right? So Joshua did as Mashal had said to him and fought with Amalek and Mashal, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Verse 11. And it came to pass when Mashal held up his hand that Israel prevailed and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Verse 12. But Mashal's hands were heavy and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Verse 13, And Joshua discomforted Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Most High said unto Mashal, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua for I will utterly, the Most High says this, I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. So we see how they want to do the space travel. They want to go to Mars. They want to go to these different things. It's, it's none other than the same, the same program or agenda that Satan said he will be like the Most High. Okay? He will exalt himself uh, above the stars of the Most High. Verses 15, And Mashal built an altar and called the name of it Ahayanisi. For he said, because the Most High have sworn, he made an oath, that the Most High will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And guess what? Amalek has not forgotten who the people of the Most High are, the descendants. You think that they don't know? Yeah, they know. They've been watching Israel. Okay? With that, dear family, getting ready to go ahead and pray out. As I take the time to be still before you, Most High, I ask that, Father, that you record this day in the heavens. As we come towards the end of this feast, I thank you, Heavenly Father, for the life-sustaining substance that you have given to us, which is the law of, your, of, of, the law of life from the dearly beloved Son of your love. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for inviting us close unto you because you dwell in the lights that no one can approach. I do not, Heavenly Father, attempt to or even plan or purpose to serve you and to flatter you with huge swelling words. I thank you, Most High, for the life that you have given to me, that you're giving meaning. And I pray that, Father, as you have strengthened Joshua and he strengthened Caleb into the 80s that they were strong just like they were in their 30s and 40s. I pray for good success on our journey. I pray that most high that you would deliver Israel out of all of their afflictions, all of their troubles. And that most high that you would hear our prayers. That you would remember Heavenly Father. You remember the the covenant that you made with Yeshia. I pray that you would plead our cause, that you would fight for us, Most High, that you would stir thyself up and do not allow any area of our lives to go unattended by you. But we ask that, Father, that you would attend to us and that you would allow us to cleave unto you and that, Father, your laws, your commandments, Heavenly Father, 
This is our understanding, Most High. I thank you, Father, for your holy angels that you encamp around us. I thank you for this truth, Most High. I thank you for the dearly beloved son of your love. I thank you, Father, for those who are alive in the earth with me now, Most High, as we experience and take this time of hearing this truth, Most High. And I know how it, how it can sound. It can be startling to some, but liberating to others, Most High. Father, allow no ounce of pride to spring up in any of your sons and daughters, Most High. Allow not, Heavenly Father, the insolent and the prideful, Heavenly Father, and the arrogant, Most High, to think that they are going to do anything. I pray that you would foil their plots and their plans, Most High. And so I don't want to telegraph, Heavenly Father, that which you are doing, Most High. I pray that you have your perfect way on everyone, Most High. Be merciful to the merciful and kind to those who are kind and gracious to those who are gracious. And be forward or forward to those who show themselves forward most high. I pray that, Father, that you would remove from us the spirit of ignorance, that you would remove from us the spirit of error, and that, Father, that you would lavish your Holy Spirit upon us and quicken thou me, O Ohio, and quicken those who want to be quickened to those who are committing and submitting their lives unto you. Pour into them in this season, Most High, of petitions, Most High, as we thank you that we were able to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. These seven days I have come before you to give you my oblation, Most High. And even as I was out working, I see that it is your hands, Most High, that have provided for me everything that I need. And even, as they said, in, in, in your, as I also endure the struggles and the battles as it takes for a man of God, I do it, Heavenly Father, with good, with good, how do you say this? With a good attitude knowing that, Father, that you see all the difficulties that I have come upon and gone through. But through your assistance and your aid there to help me, and not just me, but those like me, Most High, I pray that we would be like Yeshia. So when you look at me, Father, having no righteousness of my own, but Most High, having that standard of righteousness that you have instilled in your Son, that's what I embody. That's the sentiments that I carry and that I try to bring into remembrance to put the brothers and sisters to in brothers and sisters in remembrance of this. So I pray that you take special notice today, Father. Do not allow any of our lives to be cut off prematurely. Most high, make the canker worm give back the former as well as the latter, most high. So that our barn, our barns are our presses will be flowing abundantly, Most High. Make rivers of abundance pour out unto us. And I pray that you bless those that truly pray for your people and truly understand and are understanding, Most High. Remove, Heavenly Father, the spirit of forgetfulness. How forgetful that I can be myself at times. But I pray that, Most High, the same way that you had took Enoch and Elijah up so that their understanding would not be corrupted. As you, the angel of the present said, Most High, send us back as the angels when the sun is setting the angels go forth, giving the account, Most High, of every man, every woman's deeds that we have done in the earth. So I pray as they bring the report, Most High, I pray it's one of a good report that we have not murmured, that we have turned from our past sins, Most High, that we are endeavoring to keep the unity of faith, Most High, until we all come into the perfect knowledge and understanding of the Son of your love. So may the blood of Yeshua cleanse and purify us, Most High, as we're keeping the feast and have kept the feast of unleavened bread, not with the the, the bread 
of, of the scribes and Pharisees of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity of calling upon you with a pure heart, you know right now the plans and the inventions that the wicked is doing, Most High. Your word says in Job 20 that this is the answer or the reward to the wicked that the Most High gives. Though they may suck down riches, you will make them repay it, Heavenly Father. That Most High, that there will be no remedy, Heavenly Father. No rest for the wicked, Most High. Like it says in Nahum uh, 1 and 3, Father. So plead our cause, Most High. And hear our prayers. And you who inhabit the praise of Israel, like it says in Psalms 22 and verses 3. We want to go forth, Heavenly Father, to the feast, Most High, with the spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving for Ahia, you have done mighty things, saving our children, save our spouses, Most High, save our captains, Most High, save our elders, Most High, the leaders, Most High, save the elderly amongst us, Most High, the stranger and the orphan who have joined themselves to Israel, Most High, to make a covenant with the God, the Holy One of Israel, Most High. And as it says in Saint, not excuse me, in, in Jeremiah 16 and 19, surely the Gentiles will come unto us and say that their fathers have inherited vanities. We allow none of those vanities to come into our minds. But we cherish and remember all of the miracles that you have done. So bless us and keep us yet another day, another moment that we may bless you, Father, that we may truly enter into your courts with the spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving. We have been here now for nearly uh, three over three hours, and it seems like a matter of seconds to me. I truly have enjoyed this time, Father. I pray that your word does not fall on deaf ears most high. I pray that you would watch over your word and that where you send it most high, that it would prosper most high and that it would never return to you void, but accomplish that which you sent it to do. And every blessing that you pour out upon me, I for one propose to be ever so mindful to never give anyone the praise, the worship, or the adoration that belongeth to you and you alone. Now, as we go our separate ways, most high, May your peace and blessings be upon our families and our homes, Most High. Good health, soundness of mind, clarity, and, and what we call resolve. That you, Heavenly Father, would send thy mighty angels to, to settle any dispute or any disagreements that the enemy, his underlings, and core hearts might have against this injunction that we bring up against the wicked rulers of this world. For we know that we war not against flesh and bone, but against principalities, powers, and, and, and spiritual wickedness in high places. So we take every thought captive to the obedience of Yeshua, Hamashiach, casting out every high thing, every vain imagination that tries to exalt itself against the knowledge of your truth, we hide your word in our hearts so that we do not sin against you. And I thank you, Most High, that you have sought fit to place upon us the anointing, the prophetical office that you have given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that we might maintain in and cause the legacy that you have given to our ancestors, we being their descendants. You were their exceeding great reward. You are ours. We do not take pleasure in people, places, or things. Lest it be the people and places and things that you have placed in our lives. So rebuke the devourer. Bind every unclean, disobedient, and malignant, and rebellious, and distracting spirit, most high. Every familiar spirit. Every master spirit, most high. Every reconnaissance spirit, most high. Every monitoring spirit, most high, may they be seized with terror and totally 
paralyzed Heavenly Father and neutralized the weaponry of the enemy Most High. May they fall down wounded on the battlefield and may thy sons and daughters escape Most High. Escape with the booty as we just had read Heavenly Father. Escape Heavenly Father with what? What do you call it? When one goes to work with spoil most high. Remember what you said in Jeremiah uh, uh, 30 and 16. Those who spoil us, you will spoil most high. So go before your camp. It is in your power. It's in your hands to give the victory to the few over the many. And I just want to be a part of the tenth. So I pray for good health. I pray for good success, Most High, for your favor upon my life and the lives of those that you have entrusted in my care. So, Father, as I superimpose your sovereign word over this atmosphere, over and against the wiles of the devil, of the lies and every ill-spoken word, no weapon formed against us, whether in the spiritual or the natural, this world or the world to come, the seen or the invisible, foreign or domestic, past present or future, they simply cannot and will not ever prosper, but they must and will cease and desist immediately at the name of Yeshua. Now, make our arms to be able to break a bow of steel, Most High, and put your word and your praise in our mouths and tune our hearts into your praise so that we would give you an extravagant praise and that, Father, that you would truly delight, Most High, in us for you have caused us to rejoice and we are thankful most high so thankful most high and we bring every man woman and child on the face of this earth before your throne of grace most high to give you the praise the worship and the adoration and to pay reverence and homage to you as they should have so shall we let it be done on earth as it is in heaven and give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power the honor the glory and the dominion forever and ever and all of the father's children say aman so be it glory to ahia it is done Praise Ahia. All right, dear family. Well, I pray that you have all enjoyed this study and this stirring. This certainly, certainly was a, a stirring for show, family. Let me share this with you here. Well, actually, I won't share it because if I try to share it, well, I don't want it to echo. I'll just hit play. Which one am I going to play? So many good ones here. Let's go. Uh, our brother Ben Qual. I pray he and his family are doing well. We pray for all of our brethren and sisters, everyone who names Yeshire Hamashiach. I pray that they come to the realization and that they feel the peace that surpasses all understanding and that you would make ways to your, for your sons and daughters, a way of safe passage so that whom you command deliverance to, there's no one that can stay or stop your hands. Almighty Heavenly Father of Haya, bless your holy name. Praise the 
Alaska, we would have returned the kingdom to Israel. We don't know, so we want to get those. And also up in our the hills and meadows. They wish to be a physical let go from the get go. They look at us, think we belong in Petco or so these for advertisement like the black of get cold. But heck no, the red goes we quickly forget for to the fact we were your priests and the body's head rolls. These spirits your head flow, take your different styles from the head and we let's go. So you put your axe in the side of ass. Bless you, Sister Samuel. Bless you, Sister Renee. Where we going home? Stop him from doing that. I told you to tell that's where you find the man who might have seen his face and live. Oh, and wondering all the governors going to come to him with all the fun and the guns and sun to end. All the governors sit down to those who don't listen to them or to let them know who is a bubble in the face of the saints who stayed and took shame upon pain for the king who reigns in new days when we reveal to the ones who praise a new age, a millennium, forever then, more forever stand up, and never ends. To your life, you go from the father. Life and finally make it out of living problems. No man knows that they are out, but we'll be able in the day of power. So endure. Only I have a Only I have a Only I have a Only I have a Where are we going home? Where are we going home? Where are we going home? Only I have a Only I have all praises to the Most High, who's aware of and knows all things at all times. To his glory and honor forever. Shalom, Salah, and honor.